All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this beautiful Wednesday morning uh, in continuation of the Research and Innovation Week celebration of us here at Texas Southern University. It is with great joy and pleasure that we begin the uh, Research Center and research program overviews for the many multidisciplinary programs that we have going on here at Texas Southern University. Uh, we have a very great lineup of different centers and programs that we'll be discussing, sharing uh, their programs with us this morning. But before we begin, I would like to welcome our very own Senior Vice President for Research and Innovation, Dr. Omonike Olaleye to give us an opening remark as we begin uh, our programs for today. Dr. Lale, over to you, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. And before I start, I would like to say a big thank you to Dr. Ajewale and her great team for putting this together. This is TSU's first uh, inaugural TSU Research and Innovation uh, Week's Community Engagement, Community Education Outreach and Research Engagement Expo. Uh, we look forward to having a great day, but a lot of work went into play and a big thank you to all center directors participating and that were involved um, in person and time and money. We really appreciate you. I bring greetings from Madam President, uh, President Licia Crompton Young, as well as my own boss, uh, VP, uh, Dr. Penn Marshall. Uh, she brings her greetings. They both bring their greetings and they really appreciate all the great work you're doing. I won't stand in your way. Um, and we look forward to having a great time today and learning about your centers and the services you provide to our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lale, for that warm uh, opening and welcoming us as we begin today's program. We will go ahead and get started by uh, bringing up Dr. Casper. Dr. Casper is going to be moderating the very first session of our center overview, which will consist of five different centers. So each center is going to present for about five to six minutes. And then we would follow that with a collective you know, discussion, question and answer from the audience, as well as from the panelists in between. So, Dr. Casper, I turn this over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. J. Wole. Um, our first speaker this morning, good morning, everyone, first. Our first speaker this morning is going to be Dr. Dominic Green with the TSU SHAPE Initiative. Good morning, Dr. Green. Good morning, Dr. Casper. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ajawale. I want to start out by apologizing for the technical issues. As Dr. Casper said, my name is Dominique Gwynn, and I am one of the co-directors of the Texas Southern University SHAPE Initiative. The SHAPE Initiative um, is a federally funded program funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. We have four youth and adult campus and community-based initiatives. Um, the TSU SHAPE Initiative was founded in 2014 in the School of Social Work by Drs. Grace Loud, um, Dr. Butte Queen, our interim provost, and Dr. Dr. Nicole Willis. Currently, we have three programs. Um, the CHANGE program, which services um, male and females 18 and above. Our YES program that services individuals, male and females, 13 to 24 years of age. And then Brothers Project, which services um, ethnic minority males 16 and above. Please advance the screen. Okay, so we provide many services, um, assessment and counseling. So all participants receive um, baseline assessment, pre and post test counseling, follow-up visits. Um, that is, you know, supportive counseling uh, with motivational interviewing. They receive um, sexually transmitted infection health services. So we offer HIV testing, gonorrhea, chlamydia, hepatitis, syphilis, um, testing and referral to treatment. We have group education sessions um, around our program targets, HIV, hepatitis, STIs, substance abuse, both on campus and in the community. We also do um, professional service provider training. Um, this year, we have four quarterly trainings. Our first training was last week and it was on a healthy sexual curriculum. Our next is in June and it's on cultural humility, implicit bias. 
Um, later on that year, we have social determinants of health and trauma-informed care. In addition, um, we link um, participants to both community service linkages and community referrals, linking individuals to care for substance abuse, uh, misuse, mental health um, disorders, and then other services like housing if they need it. And then we provide social support, um, which is follow-up and intensive case management for participants with complex needs. Advance the slide, please. So some of our key highlights. To date, we have served over 6,500 program participants. 95% of those identify as ethnic minority. We have established the first on-campus PrEP clinic with AIDS Foundation Houston. And PrEP, um, ladies and gentlemen, is the pill that prevents HIV. And we have that on campus. To date, we have identified 11 HIV seropositive individuals and linked them to care. Um, we have been an academic internship site for 24 um, undergraduate and graduate students and have partnered with over 40 plus community-based entities. Next slide. Now to date, 3% um, of those that we provided services to were 13 to 17 years of age and 41% were 18 to 24. Now in terms of our youth community partnerships, um, we partnered with Miles Ahead Scholars Program, the Urban Enrichment Institute, Yates High School, Wheatley High School, the Salvation Army and YMCA to name a few. And we have each semester about five um, TSI peer advocates, which are volunteers that are educated and then take uh, the information back to their, um, their peer networks. Next slide. So some of our recruitment strategies, um, definitely building relationships and networking, um, engagement with our community partners, um, referrals from you know, the relationships we build, the networks, community partners. And I think probably the most important um, recruitment strategy is patient assisted recruitment, because you know, what better recruitment or what better um, person to speak for you than a happy customer. Also, advertising. We use our list serves that we build um, at health fairs and community uh, presentations, events, um, with the sign-in sheets to further advertise um, events that we're having. Newsletters, and then social media. We have uh, four social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, and Pinterest. Next slide. Now, in terms of our uh, social media engagement and strategies thus far, we have researched over 105,392 persons um, in third, fifth ward with our, um, our social media campaigns. We have 2,165 followers across our various social media platforms. And since 2020, we've gained a little less than 1,000 new followers across our platforms. Now, our goal is 3,000 followers, and we have uh, met that by 72% to date. So for us, 21 and 22 um, were great years, and we're hoping, um, we're, we're looking forward to continued growth um, on our social media and testing fronts. Next slide. So what we see is that our aud audience really resonates well with, they like TSU related content, relationship content, um, things about mental health, um, inspirational quotes, and you know they love humorous content. Now, some of our top performing Instagram posts are, they were TSU graduation posts this year. They liked Black Hin uh, History Month. Um, and then our Megan Thee Stallion or Megan Pete alumni series post. And then we had a post that was the post that was the timeline of cuffing season. And that was one of our favorites. Next slide. I'd like to um, you know, share our organizational chart. Um, Dr. Grace Loud is the project director for the Change and Yes program. I am project director for the Brothers Project. Uh, Ms. Nicole Eichenbaum is our um, Yes and Brothers Project Coordinator, and Ms. Lanita Burton is the Change Project Coordinator. 
uh, we are currently um, hiring a program psychiatrist. Um, our administrative assistant is Ms. Rhonda Lewis. Uh, Ms. Lisa Maddox is our um, licensed uh, medical social worker who does case management and program assistance. Um, we have five health promotion specialists, Mr. Jakinzi Tyler, uh, Ms. Genesis Pedraza, Ms. Robin Green, Ms. Uh, Tyler Rose, and Ms. Alea Thomas. Next slide. So our future goals um, for Texas Southern University SHAPE initiative is to continue service delivery, um, to increase our programming for sexual and gender minorities, to create pathways to assist other minority um, researchers. Dr. Loud is, she has branded something um, amazing and she is sharing her model with other researchers. And um, finally, to increase our provider education opportunities. So thank you very much. This is an overview of uh, TSU SHAPE initiative. Thank you, Dr. Green, for providing an overview of all the amazing work done at the TSU SHAPE initiative. So our, our next center presenter is going to be Dr. Grace Loud with um, the community engagement call. Good morning, Dr. Loud. Good morning, Dr. Caspa. Thank you for the introduction. All right, so thank you for having me this morning. I'm here to talk about the community engagement core, which is uh, one core within the larger Center for Biomedical and Minority Health. The Community Engagement Corps is led by Dr. Veronica Ajawole and supported by myself, as well as a team of people, Mrs. E. Youssef, who's our project manager, Dr. Richards, Asada Richards, uh, who is our community-based participatory research consultant, Dr. Taylor in charge of social media, Dr. Kirby in, in charge of mass media, Ms. Lena Bean, who uh, supports us around uh, engagement and outreach, and Dr. Mejia, who's our healthcare liaison. So as you can see, the Community Engagement Corps, are, are, we are tasked with looking at specific health disparities um, within the greater Houston community, which uh, covers all of the greater nine counties that we are wanting to kind of work with ethnic minority groups, and not to only identify, but also to the, address them in some way, in a culturally relevant way, uh, through engagement, meaningful engagement. Uh, our, second our second goal is also to increase research participation, clinical trial uh, representation amongst ethnic minority groups, and to disseminate the information and the um, research that we conduct. So as part of one part of our core, the larger CBMHR core, we are placed in the center because our goal is to be a source of support for the remaining cores, the research infrastructure core, the investigator development core, and making sure that we pull those entities together so that we can support and enhance community engagement across all cores. So our goals, number one, in order to do that, is to, it consists of leveraging partnerships uh, to be able to identify and address health concerns, to engage in activities that allow us to be visible and present so that people get to know us, get to trust us, um, and are willing to engage with us. And then number three, to identify traditional, non-traditional methods or channels for being able to disseminate and also disseminate information and also receive information back. So it's almost like a continuous loop. The way we've done that to date is by our by maximizing our internal leverages. All of us who are making up the CEC bring with us our unique networks, uh, partnerships. And so with that, we can increase capacity um, to be able to make these connections with agencies and organizations. And we also bring our own specialty research interests um, to help support the core and the course development around health disparities. Externally, the CEC prides itself on being able to um, engage in some key directions. So partnerships with specifically 
federally qualified health centers, uh, community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, some of the larger healthcare systems here in our area, as well as community members. We're also focused on creating a channel to open up the lines of engagement with community health workers as they are essentially becoming the front line in terms of being able to connect with communities. And then some of our, our research partners around UTMB and Sankofa Research Institute, which is led by Dr. Asada Richards. Through these efforts we do, we have to be on multiple fronts. So we engage in seminars. Uh, each quarter we're having or hosting an outreach event where it's a seminar plus vendors um, to share their information. We're getting ready to host our third annual clinical research engagement conference. Uh, we have a social mass uh, media and print media and also being on KT, uh, KTSU radio station that comes around quarterly or semester or uh, each semester. Um, with our community health workers, we offer training that's free where they can get accredited continuing education units. And then also we are implementing, we've we started implementing focus groups and now we've moved into doing focus groups as well as community engagement studios with different populations within our geographical areas. This is just a visual of just some of the, the promotional flyers that we've sent out in reference to some of these things. We've got our save the date um, here. We've got the, just an example of what it looks like when we are trying to raise awareness and get people to kind of see what we're doing. Our magazine, our website, um, focus groups, our community connect form. So we've got multiple things going on at the same time to try to increase our visibility and engagement. We've also offered support for training students to become community health workers. We offer support for those who um, are faculty who are award awarded pilot money in order to conduct a health disparity related uh, research topic. And we've engaged with the schools in our area to teach them about careers in health disparities, in the health disparities field. Based on what we've done so far, and th most of this information that we get, we get it from our seminars and focus groups. So what we're finding is that we are on point in terms of who we want to target. Over 86% of those who engage our seminars or focus groups, they identify as a, as a member of the ethnic minority community. And the majority of them are indicating that the information that they receive, they believe that it will lead to a change in their own health, which, which is one of our target goals as well. Uh, we are consistently working to increase the number of those who are aware of and would be willing to participate in the clinical trial. And so we're really proud about that. A lot of our work or those who are represented in our efforts identify Harris and Fort Bend, as well as other counties. We're having people all the way from the East Coast joining in on our seminars and uh, sharing information. And so we believe that the CEC is primed to become the TSU hub for institutional partnership and development. So as a result, we've seen so many outcomes of these multiple efforts. One, um, as a result of our um, community engagement studios with UTMB, we were able to submit a poster for our CTS, for the last CTSA meeting uh, called A Seat at the Scientific Table and what that was like engaging underrepresented minorities and what can we do to increase um, um, cancer screening and prevention. Uh, Dr. Aja Wole spearheaded the uh, receipt of the Af AFLAC grant, which resulted in $200,000 to the TSU CBM CBMHR. And as a result of that, a portion of that went to our very first community uh, impact grant, where we were able to uh, issue an RFA, have people uh, submit an application in reference to conducting a meaningful health disparity um, uh, project in the greater third ward or fifth ward communities. And so we have our very first uh, award recipient who's actively working on that project now. There, we've also received proclamations from city of a city and elected leaders who are recognizing the work that's being done here at Texas Southern University through the CEC around health disparities. And it's a great way to kind of uh, mark the moment so that we can continue the momentum. 
And as mentioned earlier, we're getting ready to have our third annual uh, clinical research engagement conference on April, Saturday, April 22nd from 9.30 to 2.30. It will be held here on campus in the Jones Building, and there will be an opportunity. We will also stream it live. Going to have a, a we have an agenda packed with some of our uh, dynamic speakers that are going to talk about the the range or the continuum of health disparities across uh, various groups. So we do ask that everyone come out. There'll be performance. There'll be food, um, and also panel participants talking about their experience with clinical trials. And just want to highlight here that as a result of the work we've done, we've got many community-based organizations that are offering their resources and their support and their donations. And so these are just some of the community partners we've had. And we wanted to highlight for our last January maternal uh, health seminar, these were just some of the donations that were made from the Bread of Life. And so we're really proud of the work we've done. So I'd like to say thank you for um listening to our overview. Thank you to the team, the CEC team. Thank you, Dr. Caspo. Thank you, Dr. Lau. And we want to also thank you for all the amazing work and the impactful work done at CEC. Um, so up next is Dr. Kihende Idowu with the Biomolecular Research and Advanced Computing Center. Good morning, Dr. Idowu. Good morning, thank you very much. Good morning once again. My name is Dr. Idowu. And I'm a virologist, a research scientist at the College of Pharmacy under Dr. Omoni Kewalale. And today I'm introducing our um, center, the Biomolecular Research and Advanced Computing Center. Ross, and this is a this is a, bio, a, a, a biomolecular and, com, and uh, computing center that is specifically focusing on the application of artificial intelligence. A molecular a quantum and molecular advanced computing in, in biological research. And together with me on this end center, we have Dr. Viciano, who is a professor of theoretical and mathematical physics slash computational physics. We have Dr. Avi, an experimental and computational physicist. We have Dr. Sundaresan, a tissue engineering and immunologist. So lastly, we have Dr. Monica Walale, who is a professor of pharmacology. So let me just give us an overview of the center. This biorack is a computational science lab that employs high-performing computing and application and optimized algorithm to solve problems in the field of biological science. What I mean, we mean that there is we use in silico techniques algorithm to solve challenges in biomedical research. And in addition to that, it is a combinatorial computational and experimental techniques. What I mean by that is. In the center, we complement what the result of an in vitro study by a computational evaluation. So if there is an experiment and we discover that a particular drug is working fine against a, a therapeutic target, to have an insight on the mechanism of action of such drug, we can take that into you know, a, a computational a study. And the computational study will give us a, a, an advanced, you know, a, a better insight of what exactly is the drug doing on the therapeutic target. In addition, the center also provides artificial intelligence drug, artificial intelligence driven computation, uh, computer aided drug design and development. So using computational techniques, we, we, we have already you know, developed pipeline and algorithm that can help us in identifying, identifying drugs, you know, giving us a clue about, about an admin property of drugs and also giving us a clue about the biological activity of a particular drug against a particular target in the disease. So the center, you know, in the center we have different packages that are useful for this for this and um, objectives, such as uh, Amber, Gromax, OpenMM, TensorFlow, for, uh, and then VMD for visualization of drugs discovery and other aspects. And the center too, we also do data analysis, data science, and bioinformatics. And let me add this. And another thing we do in the, in, the, in the center is, if there is any lab that is interested in working with us, we can come to your lab, know exactly what you do you know, in your lab. Then we can assist that, the, the lab to create a pipeline. What I mean by a pipeline is we create a computer program whereby whatever, okay, for example, if your lab, you, if what you do in your lab is to look at pharmacometrics analysis, we can assist the lab to create a pipeline. So when you have your primary data, you feed your primary data into the already prepared algorithm pipeline to give you an inference or an output at the end. This is 
the equipment that we you know, some of the equipment we recently got in through the help of the uh, Office of Research and Develop a Development and Innovation. These are very expensive equipment. This is our cluster. We have our cluster, the barracks cluster and server that was being installed by, by Dell. Very expensive, cost us almost half a million. And we also have the we have we now have a, a, a barrack computational laboratory. And what we do in this center, in this uh, laboratory is to we, we have training for as many students, like we are this center is involved in the TSU LEAP program, where we recruit as, you know, as much as 10, 15 students, training them in, in basic of uh, programming language and the application of computational um, artificial intelligence in drug discovery biological uh, research, even contact uh, COVID-19 contact tracing. So we recently got this, and this has really been serving us to achieve the aim of the center. So I know that some of the things we also do in the center, we have, we do MD molecular dynamic simulation, we do protein-protein interactions. Like I, like, like for instance, when you're looking at SARS-CoV-2 project, we have the spike, the spike protein from SARS-CoV-2 interacting with H2, the receptor on the cell. So we, we, our computational study can give us idea of how these two are actually interacting. And in addition to that, this our computational this center, computational cluster can also give us an idea of how drug, any type of a type of drug, can inhibit the molecular interactions between this receptor and the spike. And don't forget the, inter, the inhibition of this actually means no SARS-CoV-2 entry. So this the our, excuse me, the center. The cluster can do this for us, giving us a clear of molecular interactions between little small molecule like drug, as drug to a larger molecule like an enzyme or between a protein and a or, and protein. Also in the molecular dimension, we can also do we also do a kind of binding affinity, our energy, free energy binding, structural analysis, and ligand protein interaction. What time by ligand protein interaction is drug target interaction. And in addition to that, we also do drug protein structural stability. So when a particular drug binds to, to a protein, or when protein protein binds together, we can do a kind of simulation to say, okay, is this interaction disrupting the membrane integrity or functional integrity of that protein? We can do a kind of structural analysis or stability assay analysis using this computer-based algorithm to achieve that. And another thing we can do also is when you have your drugs binding to a particular target, for example, we have these drugs binding to pipe protein. Then from this, we can, from this situation, we can get a, this method can give us a clue. Okay, what is the kind of interactions? Are they just is the drug just sitting down? Or is it interacting with the essential amino acid that is needed for either the inhibition in, or induction of this particular protein? So, like we also do bioinformatics study like gene expression and some other genome analysis in the center. So the center is open for as many students, staff, and scientists on TSU campus to collaborate with us so that we can provide in silico, at in silico view of whatever they are doing in their lab, in, in, in of their in vitro study. So that's what we do at the center. And thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you, Dr. Ido, and the collaborative research done at your center. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you. Our next presenters will provide an overview of the research activities at the Bullard Center of Environmental and Climate Justice. Good morning, Dr. King and Dr. Johnson. Morning, everyone. Dr. Glenn Johnson, uh, faculty associate in the Bullard Center for Environmental and Climate Justice. Dr. Bullard is our executive director. Uh, Dr. King is our associate director. Uh, we have about five graduate research uh, assistants have about two uh, postdoc fellows. We have about four undergraduate assistants, and we have about five faculty faculty associates. Next screen, please. Water Bullet Center. Uh, Dr. Robert Bullet, uh, Center for Climate, Environment and Climate Justice, Texas Southern University, launched in 2021, $1.25 million from the Houston Endowment Foundation. The Bullet Center is housed in the Bobby Jordan McKinley School of Public Affairs and the Department of Urban Planning and Environmental Policy, where I'm a professor in that. Uh, the Bullet Center primary mission is to confront systems that create and perpetuate environmental, climate, and racial justice. They're the major components of the Bullet Center uh, education, training, and mentoring. 
uh, the education piece where we're working with graduate, undergraduate students, master's, PhD students. Uh, the training part, we have environment and career uh, training programs. It's a 12 week training program uh, that is catered toward uh, the disadvantaged community, 18 years and older, that might have something on their records. But we teach them um, um, various things like uh, a best a best and lead abatement certification, uh, hazard construction, basic construction weatherization. We get a certification for that that allow them to go back out into the field uh, to get jobs. The mentoring part of the Bullet Center consists of working with uh, grad and undergraduate students, but also students in in the, in the community. Our networking and communication. That's across five about five states that we work in. Uh, Houston, Texas, New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, Pensacola, Florida, uh, Mobile, Alabama. <clears throat> and in this networking piece, uh, they're doing community work where they're dealing with um, air, water, and so on, uh, pollution when we're working on various initiatives with them. Our research and policy piece uh, is catered to the research we're doing that it has to do air, water, and pollution. Our technical assistance and support goes to those five uh, five different cities that we're working in in five different states. We, these are community-based organizations where they have a partnership with us and also partnership with other HBCUs in the other in the other states. Our civic engagement, not only in Houston, Texas, but also in those four other states, but across the United States that deals with air, water, and, and soil pollution. Uh, we also refer to as the think tank, act tank, and uh, community engagement tank, but also refer to as building an intergenerational piece uh, for environmental and climate change jobs for, for disadvantaged uh, or youth or first generation uh, students that come out of our university, but also the ones that we work with ac across the United States. As you see in the pictures there, this is just some of our work that we do in, in various communities, which consists of workshops and trainings. Uh, one piece there with the EPA, uh, Reagan, who was here, who visited the Bullet Center. I think I should get it. Next slide, please. These are some of our current initiatives. Environment Careers uh, Workers Training Program, I talked about that, the Green Jobs Corps, Maternal and Infant uh, Environment and Health Risk Escape, that's uh, with the Bullet Center and, 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 and Baylor, uh, where we're looking at uh, Black maternal mothers who are are impacted by, by that, and we're doing the community outreach with that. Multi has a disaster preparedness communication, sustainability and climate resilience planning, community based environmental monitoring and air water monitoring program, not only in Houston, but in all the other four cities that we're working in those four states. The water equity and flood risk, climate migration, environmental equity assessment, lead exposure, LNG and patrols, and plant siting. Justice 40 and infrastructure equity training. The people of color director where we're doing that, there's the only one of this kind that would include uh, United States, Mexico, and Canada, different uh, community-based organization, which is uh, people of color uh, who will be listed in there. Uh, and the HBCU Gulf Coast Equity Consortium that we've been building for about the last 10 years um, and the HBCU Climate Change Consortium. Also with that, we have a yearly uh, HBCU Student Climate Change Conference that's hosted in New Orleans. The one this year will be from October the 10th, uh, 10th through the 12th. And some of the things we're looking at for as the water and the flooding piece is like the assessment of lead and drinking water. If we're talking about air pollution, uh, we've been fortunate enough to put up about four air monitors here in Houston, but there's other community-based organization we're working with to, uh, to do the measurement 2.5 p uh, p.m. where we noticed that in most of our communities, the air pollution is bad, but we know the air, air pollution is associated with asthma and other uh, uh, breathing and respiratory problems. The health and the physical and the mental environment is important uh, for us, so we deal with, with those issues too. And then the last piece will be on disaster planning and preparedness. We talked, of course, we experienced Hurricane Harvey here, but we looked at the past work that done on Hurricane Katrina, but looking at how the communities, uh, communities of colors, how they are impacted by, do they receive the necessary uh, uh, resources and stuff that they actually need. Next one, please. These are our current funders, uh, Houston Endowment, the Climate Imperative Foundation, JP Morgan Chase Foundation, 
Urban Institute Gulf Research Program, the Bloomberg Beyond Petrochemical Environmental Defense Fund, the Water Fund, Base Old Earth Fund, National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences, the Energy Foundation, AmeriCorps, Todd Foundation, Hershey Foundation, and Waverly Street Foundation, probably a couple more I just uh, forgot, I'm sure that's on there, but we've been able to launch that one point, uh, $2.5 million from uh, the Houston Endowment up into millions uh, over the over the last over the last two years. So we've been we've been very active and been very engaged. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Okay, you're welcome. Um, we appreciate all the work you do, and uh, we also appreciate all the staff and all the work that they do as well. Our final presenter before our Q and A will be Dr. Lee with the Center for Research on Complex Networks. Good morning, Dr. Lee. Yeah, good morning. This is a brief introduction about our center. That's NSF Center for Research on Complex Networks. So this center, in fact, uh, is, is received uh, by apply for the NSF program. That is the NSF Crest program. So that has been in NSF for a number of years. And uh, in our university, and we have two people, they are NSF Christ program director before Dr. Bobby Winston and Dr. Dimitri Karakos. So TSU tried uh, many years, and finally we received this uh, uh, NSF Christ Center in 2021. So our research component here includes three parts. One is for energy efficient, where the central network. Another one is urban transportation environment networks, and the third one is distributed compute, computation networks. These are three research tasks. In addition to that, we have also a division on education and also technology transfer, because that is related to science and technology. So we try to link these, our three research components through education and also try to uh, lecture many faculty to know how can we do the transfer, for example, transfer our research into different uh, patent or the publications. So the goal of this center here is, what is, is going to engage student participation with faculty research and try to encourage this establishment of new degree programs. And also this time here, particularly, you know, that it would enhance TSU's effort to become a tie to Taiwan University. So we have received some uh, best paper award and NSF career award, and that is the first one uh, that is in TSU history that uh, our uh, center's faculty received that in 2014-15. So in addition to this $5 million from NSF and also our Christ Center's faculty received additional $4 million award. So our Christ Center uh, faculty in, include uh, the faculties within about six departments. So, so far we published over 117. In fact, it's over 200 peer reviewed research publications in journals and the conferences. Because this is the research center here. So we spend a lot of time forced on the research part here. The major research method here, if we summarize what we used for the three you know, research tasks here is this. So you know, we could have so many data information, all the survey, all the publications and uh, from literature. There's so many, you know, this kind of data information. What we should do here? And normally we, find the problem here we are going to resolve. And then we do some analysis. So for some faculty here, just based on this part here, they could get good publications. And in addition to that, sometimes here we need to further do some numerical analysis. And also to see our numerical result is reasonable. And at the same time here, we need to do the corresponding simulation here and compare our simulation results with this numerical analysis to see if they are consistent. If they are consistent here, we finish this loop here. So this would be a good structure for research publications. This is theoretical analysis, numerical analysis, and also simulation analysis. 
So some problem here, however, we cannot, you know, set up a specific model here. So we have to deal with the problem here for this big data. We need to do big data analytics and also to have the problem-based simulation. And then we could have the approximation uh, resolution for the problem. So this is the majority methodology we utilize in our center. So our current plan is this thing. And uh, you know, this is, it would be the big uh, impact for TSU and particularly for TSU students here. We are going to continue to get the $5 million. So we tried many times to continue to get it. So the next window here for us to submit the proposal is, what is by this December here, we are going to have a letter of intent. With 100%, after we submit the letter of intent here, we should be encouraged to have the, to submit the preliminary proposal. That is February. However, this preliminary proposal here is not 100% to be encouraged to have the full proposal. So with some percent of possibility here, and uh, we may have a chance to submit the full proposal. The full proposal will be the, in December of this year. You see this is the working, the window here is pretty long, about, uh, about one year. So the majority, the questions this time here fit to our, to our cause setting. In fact, this is related to this, this big, big center project. So we needed to form a TSU stronger team because this time here, so many other university here has applied to be the MI, MISI university. They received the MIS, for example, University of Houston. This time, University of Houston is also MISI. And uh, Tamu, Texas AM University is also MISI. You know, for this university, they are all MISI. This also gives us TSU a big challenge here. How can we form a stronger TSU team with a very good research component and those education technology transform the component here and then try to compete with this university? This, uh, this MI, MISI university in the nation. So this is our questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I would now like to invite all the presenters to join, um, those that have presented this morning, to join and turn their videos for the Q&A session. Thank you. So my first question is going to go to Dr. Green. You were the first presenter and you mentioned um, testing during your presentation, SCI testing during your presentation. So the question is, um, if someone tested positive for STI, what next? How do you handle that at the center? Okay, um, well, we immediately notify them, kind of educate them um, about whatever the, dis the disease state is um, and provide pretty much a case management services referral to their preferred treatment provider. So we make sure that they are um, you know, treated and let's say it's HIV, then we have rapid start. We um, get them referred to care immediately. Um, they see someone within 24 hours and start medicine immediately. So, you know, just in summary, they're immediately referred to care. Um, they're, they're preferred treatment uh, provider. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, and now this is for Dr. Loud with CSC. Um, what are some of the ways the CEC envisions promoting or supporting long-term sustainability. Thank you, Dr. Casper. So for the CEC, we look at sustainability as similar to how we're actually doing the work and the importance of utilizing a multi-pronged approach. So one of the things is to obviously be, continue to build partnerships because through the partnerships, we expect to leverage additional opportunities, could be grant opportunities, could be just, uh, just uh, around events and engagement and outreach. And so we start to kind of shift that capacity in a way, so that way we can continue doing the work. Another way of obviously is continued public funding and also looking for private donors. I know Dr. Ajuola is taking some steps to create some private donation accounts and to let people know that if you want to contribute and support, that is one way to do that. Um, and then also, also finding opportunities to bring in faculty, students, um, community members to kind of help lift the load. We think that you're just using multiple um, approaches to sustainability is what will keep us moving forward. Thank you, Dr. Lau. Um, this question is for Dr. Johnson. Um, what is the value of partnering with communities to develop impactful projects? The value of a partnership has to do with um, 
including community-based organizations and grassroots leaders as part of the whole research and policy process. Reason being that in the past, uh, people of color communities has been exploited by predominant uh, white universities who normally would come in, do the research, do the publication, and, and increase their reputation and get tenure and promotion. The process of what we're doing is that since, since a lot of these communities represent us and our students and faculty staff at Texas Southern University, they become part of the whole research process. As a matter of fact, they drive the process in a sense by telling us exactly what are the issues that are impacted in their community. And they help us with the research questions and they drive our research questions and initiatives. And then the last thing would be is that they participate and also engage with us in uh, writing a publication and, and pushing public policies that really assist us in eliminating or reducing air, water, and soil pollution. Thank you, really appreciate it. And um, our final question is to Dr. Lee. During your presentation, you did mention forming teams. So how do we form a team um, at TSU to compete with other teams among MSIs in the nation? Yeah, in fact, uh, this is the big topic here in our co college here. In TSU, I think uh, already tried to apply it for this crisis proposal even 20 years back. I believe 20 years back. And uh, as for me here, I tried twice. And the first time I did not get it. Second time I got this uh, uh, project at PI. And how can we form a, uh, a stronger team? That is pretty important part here. And again, as I mentioned, this time here so many new technology here and had been there. And also at the same time here, so many other universities here, they, they are MSI already. So this proposal is for MSI. However, the, the, the big impact is this. This is big $5 million here with what called with no extension and with another opportunity we could get from Air Force, from DOD, from another funding agent. So definitely we need to, to identify uh, suitable people to lead this effort to create a team and a stronger team here. And so that TSU, could get another crest, you know, proposal, center proposal within the next few years. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thanks. So again, on behalf of, you know, you know, the Office of Research and Innovation, we want to thank everyone that has presented today, this morning, at least during this first session. Um, thank you for all the work you do for promoting research at TSU. And so um, I would hand it back to Dr. J. Woolley. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank everyone. My name is Linda Gardner, by the way, with the Division of Research and Innovation. I'd like to thank all of our presenters for joining in on this morning and sharing in the wonderful work that you're doing here on the campus of Texas Southern University and in your outreach efforts and engagement in our community. And so, um, up next, we have um, Dr. Bai Lee. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present my uh, research projects. Um, I like to call it test all because that's a good wish as well to provide all the testings that the community needs. And when they need it, they can have it all. Um, we, we want to talk about mitigating health disparities but from the lens of clinical laboratory science, because uh, I'm a faculty of clinical laboratory science program here at College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. And uh, before I go deep into the research uh, talk, let me uh, begin with a brief introduction of clinical laboratory science, which I call CL CL CLS as well. So through my experience talking with the community, many people don't really know who we are and what we do. Uh, clinical laboratory science uh, is a highly specialized area and we play a critical role in modern healthcare. Uh, we involve the analysis of biological samples such as blood, urine, and tissues to diagnose and monitor diseases and access the effectiveness of treatment. Uh, CLS has a wide range of specialties, um, including clinical laboratory, uh, clinical uh, chemistry, 
hematology, microbiology, and immunology, among a lot of others. Uh, uh, clinical, clinical laboratory scientists, uh, which also called uh, medical laboratory scientists, we perform complex laboratory testing uh, using sophisticated equipment and technology. We work in a variety of settings, including hospitals, research labs, and uh, public health agencies. So for anyone who wants to become a clinical laboratory professional, it requires extended, extensive, uh, extensive training and education, and you must, to, must pass a certification exam. Okay, so we talked about CLS, clinical laboratory science. We are always called unsung heroes uh, and importance of clinical laboratory science. Uh, I'll show you some data from CDC. 70% of today's medical decisions depends on clinical laboratory testing results. And there are 14 billion uh, laboratory tests ordered early. And uh, the number is actually growing drastically. Patients in rural areas often experience barriers to healthcare and laboratory services, which limited their ability to receive care that they need. So um, most of the time we're not heard because the service or the work we provide are behind the scene, are not uh, re released to or presented to the general public until COVID-19 pandemic changed the game. So this is when the lab testing has become more aware by the general public and the change happened uh, both ways. Not only we are recognized more, we also as laboratory professionals, we recognize the importance and uh, uh, necessity of increasing accessibility of lab testing to the community, um, which has become a significant uh, factor to health disparities. So looking at the social determinants of health, um, a health disparity is defined as a health difference based on one or more health outcomes that adversely affect uh, dis disadvantaged populations. And with all these aspects that can contribute, contribute to health dis disparity, we figured uh, several approaches that we can contribute to mitigating. Uh, predict local disease outbreaks by monitoring disease or even multiple diseases. Uh, improve the community testing act by offering ac uh, accessible, accessible tests and increase the accessibility of the testing by the general public. And ultimately, we possess a, a in large amount of laboratory data and by analyzing the data and with the uh, community, we can develop people and data-driven research projects that identify and mitigating health disparities. Uh, during the heavy waves of COVID-19 pandemic from uh, early 2021 to early 2022, we were founded by the U15 award to start a wastewater monitoring project through TSU campus and third world community. And we identified two uh, locations on campus and one in the third world community, collecting wastewater from the locations analysis, the data viral loads. Our results from the wastewater actually predicted uh, community outbreaks and aligned with the actual case very well. As we succeed in monitoring COVID-19 disease within the community level, we also looked into the feasibility using the same system uh, to monitor other diseases or even better, maybe we can monitor health for the community. So utilizing the same system, we collaborate with Health Depart uh, Department of Houston and gather longitudinal uh, wastewater samples through different community facilities and analysis the uh, COVID-19 viral load and microbiome data for, from the wastewater or sewage water. So we were able to find strong human gut microbiome signatures in the sewage. And uh, there are significant difference um, among samples from different facilities. So the study shows feasibility of using the sewage uh, microbiome 
as a proxy of the gut microbiome at the community scale. While finding novel approaches of disease uh, health monitoring, we also recognize the necessity of increased accessibility of uh, community testing for COVID-19. So supported by NIH initiative of rapid acceleration of diagnostics of underserved population, we launched the Test It All project where uh, the community, uh, several communities uh, in East Harris County areas are identified as uh, disproportionately affected by COVID-19 pandemic and they have limited access to testing and care. We implemented uh, testing, uh, a COVID-19 and flu A and B combined antigen testing to the community. Uh, through, the, through the test it all project, we want to determine the facilitator barrier of testing, vaccine, and treatment, evaluate the testing strategy that we enrolled, and we also provided education on COVID-19 testing and the disease and treatment. Uh, through the test all project, we leveraged um, partnerships with community-based facilities and organizations to understand the community uh, needs perspectives of COVID-19 testing. We were able to partner up with 12 local facilities and we have uh, six community members join our community steering group, serve as the leading, uh, serve as the leading and uh, power for our uh, community outreach. Uh, through the project, we set up one CLIA certified clinical lab to provide the testing for the community. Uh, we deployed community health workers, uh, TSU alumni for the testing. We organized 32 COVID-19 testing and education events, participate in 26 community events, reach out to over 4,000 community members, recruit, recruit uh, 156 participants for the study. Uh, we were able to identify the need to increase public awareness and accessibility to multiviral testing and point of care testing. So the future work uh, will focus on utilize our community connections and work with community to identify their needs in health equity and implement people and data driven uh, community research. Thank you all for the opportunity and thank you for listening. Uh, have a good day. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for sharing the information on clinical laboratory and mitigating health disparities in our community relative to COVID-19. You're doing a great work and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Dr. Gwendolyn Goodwin and Dr. Lewis, who will be presenting um, from the Center for Transportation Training and Research. Dr. Goodwin, good morning. Well, again, good morning. Delighted to be here. Dr. Goodwin serves as our center uh, director, and uh, we're always excited about Research Week at Texas Southern University because it's always wonderful to hear about the uh, initiatives and uh, all of the engagements that um, our colleagues have campus-wide. We are in the College of Science, Engineering, and Technology, a uh, companion to the Transportation Studies Department, which offers the Master's in Transportation Planning and Management, Bachelor's in Maritime Transportation Security, and ba Bachelor's in Aviation Science. And we have this here because one of the things about our research is that it is extremely important to us to have our students uh, participate. And so we really want them to get the opportunity to understand the research methods uh, to clearly um, be able to conduct the literature reviews and the analyses and uh, take those things all the way to uh, fruition. We think that that helps them no matter what they choose to do as a career. Uh, our center was started in 1983 under Dr. Naomi Lede. We are the longest continuous running center on campus. So this is our 40th year. Uh, so we might try to do something uh, hoop uh first semester in the fall. Uh, initially, we were focused on public transportation, started with the grant from the Federal Transit Administration. We expanded, though, now to include uh, just all modes, our highways, 
how land is used and the interaction between land use and transportation. Over the years, we've done evacuation planning, particularly after we had hurricanes Harvey and Rita. Uh, transportation security, we uh, did uh, lots of research on petrochemical incidents. And then uh, recently we've started working with automated and connected vehicle technologies uh, because that is the emerging uh, area within our discipline right now. I actually served as the director for 25 years. I really believe in succession planning. So I baton handed, as I say to somebody a little younger. So Dr. Goodwin uh, now has that role. Uh, we have three to six faculty and staff members uh, working with us. Uh, normally three to five graduate research assistants. And I've mentioned the importance to us of having our students uh, be participants. Uh, in in those particular areas. And then depending upon sort of the work we're doing, we have relationships with uh, urban planning, environmental policy, engineering, and other uh, folks on campus. So we have more than 200 graduates who have worked at the Center for Transportation Training and Research. And the thing that gives me great joy is when they land well. And then years after we hear about the work they're doing, and they have learned many of their skill sets, not only in our academic units, but also by conducting the research. So this slide just gives you a, a perspective of where, where our students are. Uh, Jermaine Hannon is actually the second highest ranking person with FHWA in Indiana, um, DOT. Uh, Robin Armstrong, La Las Vegas Aviation Department. So again, you see our breadth. We've got railroads, we've got public transportation, we've got those who are doing highways as we've got folks at TxDOT and DOTs across the nation. This continues. We have a lot of our graduates working at, at a Metro and uh, Houston Galveston Area Council, which is the, uh, the conduit for getting all of the federal money in for every project that we have in the region. And then um, I wanted to mention, I don't see his name, but Juan Morrison uh, was with FTA and then he worked with Metro and Safety. And the thing that was interesting about Juan, Juan's assignment is that when the purple light rail line was open, the one that's on Scott and goes down uh, Wheeler, Juan was actually the person that Federal Transit Administrator sent to do the safety review. So we were extremely excited about that. We look at our overall goals, and these are the things that we try to focus on as we conduct our research. Uh, we also always wanna have a creative research agenda. We always, again, want to provide an environment for students to explore and to you know, get their hands wet um, and, absolutely, again, uh, have total involvement in our research, uh, encourage critical thinking and analysis. We always want to have scholarly dialogue because that's how we all get ahead. And then obviously uh, get the research funding uh, that continues to allow us to uh, do the things that we do. We look at uh, work that we've done over the last three years. Uh, many of you will remember the automated campus, the automated vehicle that we had on campus. Uh, the point of that work was that we were actually investigating both uh, passenger acceptance, but the real focus was on battery life uh, because this is Houston, it's very hot. And so um, the manufacturer had said that the battery should last eight hours. We learned that on our very hot and humid days in, in Houston, it only lasted five, very important finding. Uh, we do uh, what's called a mystery shopper with uh, Harris County, just investigating uh, how that entity is doing in terms of a service provision. Um, might seem like you're kind of, you know, planting and spying, but uh, to make sure that the drivers are operating safely and that they are being uh, customer friendly uh, to those that uh, they engage. Uh, we've done workforce implications of automated vehicles. I know everyone who hears about automation, uh, hears the side conversation that it's going to make people lose jobs. So we did investigation with that and actually uh, don't think that it will make people lose jobs, but it will change jobs. Uh, people who used to be perhaps frontline vehicle operators will change their positions to uh, 
potentially run the automation and or help uh, verbalize to customers about how to uh, utilize and respond to uh, the automated sessions. Uh, really talking about equality and equity now. So we're looking at uh, many projects that allow us to determine it, 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 it allows us actually to put some values on what we know is that public transportation is not equitable right now. Um, depending upon where you live in Houston, your travel time is extremely long. Uh, if you, for instance, live in A-Leaf and want to work at the airport, it's, a, it's like a two hour trip one way. So these are things that we're looking at. Also uh, looking at uh, equality and tolling. And because that trip that I just talked about, in order to uh, make the trip in less than the two hours, you'd have to use the toll road. So if you don't have that kind of resource, then that makes it very expensive for you to try to get to a job uh, in that way. And then we're looking at virtual learning. Um, we know that during the pandemic, we all started doing some hybrid and virtual classes, but we're looking at that and also uh, from an equity lens, um, that students in lower income communities don't do as well with the virtual learning. And then one of our big projects that we still are needing to work on is to help TxDOT to improve their uh, DBE contractors. We don't really have a lot of uh, African Americans who get those big dollar projects. And we know that the I-45 redo is about a $9 billion project. And so we're working to try to ensure that um, the, the DBEs have at least a, a reasonable opportunity to participate in that work. Uh, these are other projects we're working on. I won't go through them in detail, but uh, sort of looking at vulnerable communities that are in mega regions. And so that work is, is looking at what we call the interstices is, is the air, the areas between Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin, where we've got uh, people with extremely low incomes who would benefit by being able to get into the urbans for jobs, healthcare, et cetera. And again, I won't uh, go through everything that's here, but the last thing I'll mention, and the students that you see uh, in the green are Houston Summer Transportation Institute. We've done this for 17 years. And the, and the purpose of that is to interest high school students in transportation careers. So we're actually going into our 18th year of that. We do it not only in Houston, but uh, we move around the state. We've done Port Arthur, we've done San Antonio, we've done it in uh, Dallas. And so we, uh, and I think Corpus Christi as well. So we move around again, trying to get students interested in our careers. Things that we're working on upcoming, uh, Metro is planning to do a phase two of the automated uh, uh, vehicle. Uh, this time it's not going to be on campus, though. It's going to be on Cleburne, and the learning and uh, research objectives are different. This time we're looking at how other uh, vehicles interface with um, the automation, and we'll be looking at how the vehicle acts with signals. So that's our research focus this time. Um, other things that are there, you're free to read. I won't talk to them, but it just gives you, again, the breadth of, of the kind of research that we have underway. And that concludes my uh, comments this morning. Thanks to all of you for listening. Look, we think this is so fascinating. So I don't know if people outside your discipline see it and it's like, oh, okay, Carol, that was like, mm. but you know, it charges us up. So hopefully, I did a little bit to make you think is what we do is interesting. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, Dr. Carol Lewis. Um, we, you know, 40 years, my goodness, mm -hmm. um, that is amazing. And we most certainly uh, here at the Division of Research and Innovation would like to thank your founding director, Dr. Naomi uh, Lede, yourself for your 25 years of service and um, and for Dr. to Dr. Goodwin, who's taken on that baton, I mean that's a that's a huge uh, hat to to wear. And so we thank you for your participation and your consistent participation in our research uh, week program over the last 21 years. I know, so it's a great accomplishment, and we thank you so much. We look forward to your celebration of your 40 years. Okay. And thank so thank you. you so much for presenting on this morning. Uh, we're going to move forward, and uh, in our program. 
we have Dr. Jasmine Drake, who's going to be presenting on the TSU Forensic Science Learning uh, Laboratory. Good morning, Dr. Drake. So good morning. Today, I'm going to talk about some of the work and the training that we are currently doing at the Forensic Science Learning Lab here at TSU. Oops. So the forensic uh, science faculty that we currently have here are uh, Dr. Ashraf uh, Moziani. She serves as the executive director of the Forensic Science Learning Lab and myself, who uh, also I serve as the laboratory coordinator for the Forensic Science Learning Lab. Um, both myself and Dr. Moziani, we both have practitioner experience in the fields of forensic science. Dr. Moziani was over a lab here in Harris County. I also have worked at uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration as well. And um, we've both served at some capacity as commissioners um, for the Texas Forensic Science Commission. The Texas Forensic Science Commission in the state of Texas, this is very important because they're the board that's the oversight board for all of the labs in the area. So we typically uh, see, uh, can you hear us? We typically see all of the uh, incidents that happen in the labs, any misconduct by practitioners. Um, and we also do investigations for uh, things in the field, like different uh, methods that are used to uh, create recommendations and best practices in the field. So our forensic science learning lab is a state of the art uh, laboratory. Many people don't know that we have this lab tucked away on the third floor of the Barbara Jordan Mickey So I was saying we have the state of the art forensic science learning lab. Um, we, a lot of people don't know that we have it. Uh, it's a mock crime lab and it has all of the instrumentations that uh, modern crime labs have. And actually we have a lot of cool instrumentation if anybody wants to do tours. Um, we are able to do DNA analysis, toxicology, drug analysis, anthropology, um, even tool marks and uh, even some of the digital evidence things. So we have a wide array of different instrumentation and technique. Okay. And so we, we actually provide training for students, uh, community stakeholders, practitioners, practitioners, lawyers, uh, judges. So anybody pretty much that'll come in and visit, we will uh, share some of the forensic science education and knowledge. And we also do a lot of like camps and things and research collaborations as well. These are just some pictures of our students actually able to get hands-on training, which is really important in the forensic science lab. And so it prepares them. They're able to do research projects. We're able to have students um, present at different um, national conferences and local conferences as well. And so the students really love the coursework and the research because they really have a good time and their hands dirty. Here are just some of the training uh, opportunities I want to point out in the lab. Like I said, we do sometimes like the summer uh, programs on CSI or DNA or different topics. We've done work with the National um, Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, local law enforcement, as well as um, like um, attorneys such as the Houston, um, the Harris County uh, Public Defender's Office and different offices. So why is research really important in the forensic science community? Well, one thing is that uh, a lot of the work that we do has an impact to criminal justice outcomes. And so um, across the country, and especially in Texas, we've seen a large number of wrongful conv convictions, and especially um, in the Black community. So um, there are disparities that we've seen in the number of wrongful convictions that happen. So it's important that we get the science right. And so actually studying the methods that are being used and to make sure that those are accurate and reliable is really important. Some areas of research are general forensics. So we're looking into just emerging scientific specialty areas, uh, drugs, DNA. We um, look at impression evidence and uh, trace evidence or small evidence found at a scene. Some of our funded grant opportunities that we've had, we've uh, worked on 
uh, in collaboration with um, NIH, with uh, Baylor College of Medicine, we've worked on disparities and stillbirths in minority communities. That work was also done in collaboration with support from the Center for Justice Research. Um, also, we've done a COPS Community Policing Development micro grant, which was um, really cool. It was a youth summer camp, so we spent three weeks virtually with elementary, middle, and high school students. So that was really uh, rewarding. And the students, we're trying to impact them at earlier ages. We've also had work on uh, the DNA from and support from NIJ, um, as well as internal C grants and things that have been sponsored by the research office to continue our research areas. We've also kind of got into media. So um, for the research, and uh, taping. We've done quite a few like uh, film opportunities. I never expected that to kind of happen, but um, we were able with, you see Miss uh, Zuri Dale there, we were able to film in the lab that was used for the scenes for the uh, College Hill um, show. And so we were able to uh, utilize the lab and actually show, you know, showcase our lab at a larger scale. So then I got a lot of calls and Dr. Moziani got a lot of calls of people who were like, oh, you have that lab there, that's nice. You know, so um, anything that we can get students interested in other people for recruiting is great. We've also, based on research, I've done some uh, research on disparities in the opioid epidemic in uh, collaboration with the Center for Justice Research. Um, we've had NPR interviews, and I've also been on ABC 13 talking about the devastation of the opioid uh, epidemic. So I'm still continuing to do work in that, those areas. We've also done some more uh, recent film opportunities. I think it was taped like a year ago. So we're currently, myself and Dr. Moziani, we're featured on CSI on trial. So if you have Curiosity TV, um, you can go to the Bite Marks ep uh, episode and you'll see both of us featured there. And that's currently screen streaming. So thank you for your attendance and sorry for all of the disruptions with our technology. They didn't want to behave. Thank you so much, Dr. Drake, for all of your participation and your help with Research Week in itself. But we most certainly thank you for your presentation on this morning concerning research, um, sorry, I'm sorry, forensic science and the learning laboratory. Uh, you know, a lot of what we do are here at Texas Southern University are well-kept secrets. And so we're so happy to see that you're uh, getting out in the uh, media and film uh, projects. And so we just thank you for your presentation on this morning. Thank you so much. Um, next, we have up Dr. Howard Henderson, the Center for Justice Research. Good morning, Dr. H Henderson. Perfect. Well, listen, good morning. Uh, again, it's good to have the opportunity to kind of talk through uh, the work that we're doing in Center for Justice Research and, and get everyone a feel for, you know, how it is we do what we do and why we do what we do. You know, there are a couple of points that, that I think are important before I move forward, and that is this. Uh, you know, our goal is to turn data into solutions um, and use Houston as sort of our landscape uh, to help understand how to solve some of these problems, given that Houston actually has the third largest criminal justice system in the country. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to use data and community insight that we need uh, to conduct research, but also form solutions. Um, we believe that our research is advocacy. You know, there's some people who go out in the streets and protest and the others who take different approaches. We believe that providing data uh, to the right people is, is our form of advocacy. Uh, we essentially advocate for culturally responsive and sensitive reform in the area of criminal justice as we see around the country. Um, let me move my slide forward. You know, I, I've kind of broke our mission up into uh, multiple bullet points because we believe essentially that our mission is to reduce mass incarceration through targeted approaches uh, that are culturally responsive and sensitive, but also evidence supported uh, through a series of strategic engagements. What we found is that when you look at criminal justice around the country, most of it's run by a misperception folklore and not fact-based. And a lot of people don't realize that there is a science to this uh, and there are proven approaches that can be taken and are taken in many places uh, around the country. Now, 
we believe in following what we call a translational research model, which is what we borrowed from uh, the folks over in the hard sciences. I've been looking at this over a number of years. Um, we don't just do research in a vacuum. We make sure that as we move along and identify problems that we have constant communication and we're in constant communication with people in the community, uh, policymakers, community members, people who make decisions, because we feel like all those folks are necessary uh, to move us in the right direction. And because of that, we've been able to be uh, fairly successful in helping uh, transform policies, not only in Houston, but around the country, uh, trying to find ways to reduce not just racial disparities, but ethnic disparities and class-based disparities. Now, we begin with a few questions that sort of serve as a motivation for our research. And those questions are simply, you know, why aren't more academic researchers in criminal justice concerned with contemporary problems? Uh, two, um, why can't we get our information into the right hands and begin to change policy? Three, why don't we expand what is meant by lived experiences to include more than people who have been incarcerated, but people who have lived experiences in the community? We understand that the historical legacy of racial and class exclusion and structural inequalities in housing, economic opportunity, uh, social political force and form, a social context for race and class inequalities as exists in our criminal justice system. And so given that foundation, we sort of use that as the, as the nexus for, for how we move forward. I'm gonna kind of go over a couple of our projects that we have. We have a plethora of projects, but I wanna focus on uh, the key ones we're working on right now. Um, <clears throat> We have two primary projects that I put above all the others uh, because they're national in scale uh, and they involve more than just Houston, but they involve California, Colorado, New Mexico, Mississippi, and Texas, for example. We have a, a gun possession project uh, where we interviewed 400 young black males uh, about their experience with gun possession. You saw uh, our doctoral student, Denise, present uh, those findings on Monday. Uh, that project came about because we recognized that in the national conversation about gun violence, nobody had a conversation with these kids. And, and we know that these kids have the greatest likelihood of being engaged in gun violence. The research tells us that, you know, firearm violence is one of the most devastating and burdensome public health issues in the country uh, with an annual economic toll of $280 billion, uh, and rates are almost 25 times higher uh, than race in other developed countries. You know, Black kids in the U.S. are over eight times more likely to die from firearm homicide than white kids, and homicide has become the leading cause of death for Black boys uh, starting at the age of 18. You know, while demographic and structural factors, social factors of firearm behavior have been identified, uh, there's variability in this discussion and policy solutions. So with this study, uh, we've been able to interview kids in Houston, Jackson, Mississippi, Baltimore, Maryland, and Wilmington, Delaware, to find out what it was they felt motivated their desire to pick up a gun and in some cases use it. For example, we talked to a kid in Houston. Uh, I interviewed a kid who had been shot twice at the age of 17. And so, you know, some of these things, though, though they're very troubling, uh, we need to have those conversations. And we appreciate uh, Dr. Gartner and her IIB for giving us the approval to do that study, because I understand it's very challenging dealing with that population. But Again, my hat's off and appreciation to the IRB for making sure we made that happen. A uh, second study we're looking at is prosecutor diversion. So around the country, prosecutors are saying that they want to find ways to keep people out of jail and prison. And the question is, okay, how much money are you saving by doing that? Uh, with this prosecutor diversion study, along with one of our postdoctoral fellows, we're looking at whether or not it's financially beneficial because we understand that for one side of the political aisle, they want to understand the dollars and cents. And so we want to be able to communicate that with people who have different political persuasions. Uh, that project is going on. We just started that about six months ago. Uh, another project we have that's also being led by uh, Dr. Jasmine Drake, we recognize that there are faculty, there's a disconnect between what faculty do in the classroom and research. And we want to make sure that these young faculty have what they need to be successful along the team track. We went to a funder with the idea and we developed a five-year research and development program where we bring in five untenured faculty members from around the country each year 
and we take them through monthly training sessions to teach them and educate them on everything from you know how you how you obtain tenure and maintain your soul, how do you navigate the academic space, but also how do you engage in this social justice work. That project, again, we're in the second year of that project. We're excited to have it. I think it means a lot. I wish I would have had that sort of project uh, when I was a doctoral student, but again, that project is ongoing and it's one that we hope to build on. The, the next project we have uh, is in conjunction with the Black Public Defender Association funded by the George Foundation in Chicago. Uh, we realized that when you look at crime in Chicago, nobody's really talking to people in the community. So we linked up with a group of public defenders to use their vantage point to help us understand what the needs are in Chicago. Springboarding from that project, we, we make it to Houston. Um, we went to a funder and we said, listen, you know, it, we're in Houston, we're doing a needs assessment in Chicago. Why don't we look at Houston? Um, given uh, the rise in crime, given the fact that every time you turn the TV on, uh, there's someone being robbed, someone being murdered, someone being shot. We felt like we need to do a needs assessment in our own city. So we, we were funded to do that. And, and the goal is to help understand, you know, what's happening in city in Houston from the zip code and the census block perspective. Uh, we are engaging other HBCUs in this process, but we're also engaging community groups so they help us understand how they see these issues uh, from their perspective. I'll leave it there. I know that I'm running tight on time. Hopefully I didn't go too much over, but if you guys ever wanna be updated about the work we're doing, here's our website. Uh, we're on every social media uh, option, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn. Um, we're there, we're posting daily several times a day. Um, and our goal in posting that stuff is to make sure we're educating people, we're informing people about solutions uh, as, as they are developed around the country. So thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Henderson, for all of the work that you're doing in uh, the Center for Justice Research. Uh, very relevant um, work that you're doing in the, the, the light and the awakening of all of the things that are happening concerning individuals having guns and um, doing many things with these guns that, um, like you said, are not comfortable conversations to have, but conversations that must be had. Most certainly thank you for the Research and Development Institute and what you're doing for our students and your participation in Research Week and your support and sponsorship in um, research and in our innovation, research and innovation week. So thank you so much, Dr. Henderson, for all that you do. Next, we have up um, the Center of Excellence for Housing and Community Development Policy Research. Dr. Lowe is our presenter, Dr. Jeffrey Lowe. Good morning, Dr. Lowe. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Gardner. Uh, thank you for uh, providing me the opportunity this morning to share a little bit about the Center of Excellence for Community Development and uh, uh, policy research. And Mr. Harmon, thank you uh, so much for um, assisting me and guiding me through these through the slide uh, presentation. The Center for Excellence, the Center of Excellence for Housing and Community Development Policy Research is, is one of the youngest or newer centers on campus. We were actually established um, last year. Uh, through sponsored research uh, funding from the Department of Housing and uh, Community, excuse me, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, uh, Office of Policy Development and Research, um, through an award of $1 million for, uh, for three years. And our efforts uh, through our work, through the Center of Excellence, is actually uh, to focus on the six largest cities by population in the state of Texas. That would be Austin, Dallas, El Paso, Fort Worth, Houston, and San Antonio. And certainly three of those cities are the large, uh, three of those cities, um, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, 
are in the top uh, 10 cities in the nation uh, by population. And our work really intends to inform policy research, inform decision makers and policy makers um, through HUD. And what we want to do is uh, focus on policy learning outcomes from our research and analysis of race neutral policies and their disparate impacts. So the slide that you see in front of you uh, not only shows our uh, cooperative agreement with HUD uh, and, and, and Texas Southern uh, University, but it also shows our partnerships and our collaborations. We're working with um, uh, certainly our partners uh, being the University of uh, one of our flagship campuses in the state, uh, their planning program and law school at the University of Texas at Austin. But we're also one of our other partners is um, Alabama A&M um, University, which is the only um, HBCU, Historically Black College or University, in the United States that has an undergraduate degree in planning. So a lot of our work is intended to be really developmental, extending the pipeline of future researchers uh, and, and scholars in policy research, as well as develop and enhance our own capacities by working with others, uh, scholars from the University of Illinois, Banner Champaign, the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and uh, our partners, as I've, I've just mentioned. Next slide, please. Yes. So we've divided up our, our work. We have seven um, research projects that we, uh, some have begun, um, others will begin as we uh, move forward, but we have seven research projects that our investigators uh, will carry out. And these research projects are actually uh, developed under, uh, under two themes. The first theme focuses on individual community wealth building and housing security. Uh, the overarching research question here is, how has policy or program implementation intended to foster individual and community wealth building and security through home ownership or low income rent renting benefiting residents and communities of color uh, in Texas. Um, I've included in my slides just a little bit, at least in terms of the topic that each researcher uh, will carry out. Certainly, um, the first one with Dr. Frisch, um, I'll share with you his hypothesis. And his, his work is really guided by the hypothesis that land and monetary regulations are insufficiently structured to close the racial home ownership gap. We have another project um, where myself, uh, along with Jordan Yen at Alabama A&M University, will be uh, looking at uh, wealth building and uh, distressed and low resourced African-American uh, neighborhoods. And our work is guided by a hypothesis that the level and type of local mediated forms of collective ownership accompanying public subsidy and housing programs and land development is more beneficial for low income households and surrounding communities than private property development. Dr. Greenlee who's focusing on housing choice vouchers uh, and its uh, ability to mitigate uh, housing instability and insecurity uh, work is driven by looking at these vouchers 
as, and to determine whether or not they serve as a buffer against multiple forms of housing instability, including rental price uh, increases and disasters. Last but not least, um, Professor Wei, who's at the law school and runs the law clinic at the University of Texas, Austin, in her work looking at air property ownership, uh, her work is driven by the hypothesis that the inability to access tax exemptions or savings places air property homeowners at higher risk of living in dangerous living conditions and of losing their homes through code enforcement action. Next slide, please. Our second theme focuses on planning and infrastructure and how often inequities in planning and infrastructure uh, affects um, low resource and underserved uh, communities. And we actually have three projects um, that are um, happening uh, under this theme. Again, focused primarily on the uh, six largest cities by population uh, in, in Houston. Uh, the project under um, that will soon um, commence uh, and uh, co-led by investigators, uh, Dr. Mueller at, uh, in the Department of Planning School of Architecture at UT Austin, along with uh, Professor Martina Cartwright will uh, undergo um, efforts that looks at city enforcements of deed restrictions, limiting development to single family residences in combination with other restrictions and how they contribute to ongoing patterns of inequality and in neighborhood conditions and housing choices for renters and low income households disproportionately affected by, disproportionately affecting households in, and communities of color. And this is one project will, that will primarily have a Houston focus. Uh, also, uh, the work by uh, Dr. Hawkins in the School of Communications here at Texas Southern University will be looking at how low income and mostly communities of color will have less broadband competition and fiber optic services resulting in a lack of access to high-speed internet and connective technologies. And that as a result leads to a widening uh, gap um, amongst households uh, of color in many communities. The last project that um, will gain attention um, through our work at the Center of Excellence is one that's undertaken by our assistant director, uh, Dr. Laura Solitaire, uh, my colleague here at Texas Southern in the Department of Urban Planning and Environmental Policy. And Dr. Solitaire's work is driven by the hypothesis that the legacy of noxious land uses and racialized public policies has resulted in a lack of quiet zones in low-income communities of color, uh, as well as creating communities in distress. Next slide, please. So as I've given you uh, an overview of the um, seven projects, uh, under the uh, two themes, respectively, four and one and three and the other, I think it's important to note that uh, this is the first time that TSU has received HUD support for empirical or policy um, research. And that um, 
this research, this sponsored research, will really um, afford us an opportunity of, of, of not just gaining the resources, but undertaking research that's developmental, that flows from uh, students at the undergraduate level to graduate level, and also offer us an opportunity uh, through our research and publications to influence uh, policy making uh, at the various levels of, of government, certainly at the federal level. And the second thing that I think is important is the role that we know is important as there is a seeking to uh, an, an aspiration, if you will, to become, uh, to gain um, R1 uh, status, that sponsored research and this type of funding certainly uh, is important uh, and a priority as we uh, uh, seek to become uh, uh, a better research to institution and aspire to become research one. Along with those aspirations, we hope that we will have um, long life. And as a result, sustainability becomes really important. As we seek to not only uh, establish ourselves and grow, we want to sustain ourselves to the point that we become the destination point um, for new knowledge as a result as, uh, and, and results as it relates to um, influencing the direction of policymakers and fulfill HUD's um, interests from the unique perspective of, of Texas Southern uh, University, uh, a historic uh, Black university and college that is surrounded um, by uh, low, a low resourced, if you will, a low resourced and, and in many cases underserved um, community. And so building upon this, this sponsored uh, research, we hope that it will enable us to leverage and gain and build uh, partnerships, not just internally to TSU, but externally and gain uh, additional uh, government and philanthropic foundation support. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Lowe, for all of your collaborative work with the other institutions relative to individual and community wealth building and housing security and planning and infrastructure inequity effect, affecting undeserved, underserved communities. And so we thank you so much for all that you are doing here at Texas Southern University. At this time, we're going to um, move into our Q&A session. So we're gonna ask that all of our um, presenters for this session or for this segment of session one, please turn on your cameras. And we're, we have a few questions for some of you. And in the interest of time, we ask that you try to keep your uh, answers um, uh, down to you know, a minimum in length. And so our first question is for Dr. Jasmine Drake. What does it mean to have a forensic science learning laboratory at an HBCU? And what are the opportunities for transdisciplinary research? Thanks, Dr. Gardner. I think we have a unique opportunity at a HBCU. When we look at the field of forensics, we don't see uh, very much representation and that's similar to when you look at STEM fields. So we have an opportunity to actually create some diversity and train some leaders for the future that can actually work in these fields since we're underrepresented. I mean, it's astonishing when you go to conferences and in these different workplaces. So we have the opportunity to train these students to go work in forensic laboratories, as well as doing research in those areas. And the collaborative research, there's a lot of work that can be done between the criminal justice system, of course, 
since there are criminal justice outcomes to a lot of the forensic science, but we're learning because forensic science has so many different specialty areas, um, there's a large array of different research collaborations that can be done. Thank you so much, Dr. Drake. Our next question is for uh, Dr. Henderson. How does CJR model move the conversation on criminal justice reform in the right direction? You know, I think, you know, for, for us, you know, I, I wasn't always an academic. I spent time in the field before I became an academic. And so my concern has always been how do you get people to use the information that you know, right? Mm -hmm. and, and how do you get them to take that information and, and change policy? Uh, I'll use an example. We, every research question that we come up with comes up after we've observed some problem, someone brought something to us and say, hey, we're challenged by this issue. And so we use that as a motivation to go answer the question. The Harris County District Attorney's Office was trying to find a way to reduce disparities in marijuana uh, sentencing in the county. So when we ran the data, we found that if they were to reduce the penalty marijuana less, then you would significantly reduce the number of young and minority students in the county who were just kids and had marijuana in their possession. By doing that, they cut down on thousands of arrests, right? And that that's huge, right? Because you got a lot of 18, 19, 21-year-old kids who may be college students. They may just be riding around smoking a little marijuana in their possession, having their possession. They don't need to have a criminal record on their background, those kind of things, right? And so I think, you know, the model that we use, and that is using real-life problems to solve is, is the way I think the future is demanding that we be. The academy used to be that way, right? I think if you talk to the folks on this on this Zoom call, that's what they're already doing. Um, but I think that's unique because I don't know if every university takes that approach. Uh, but I know in looking at what my colleagues are doing, I think many people already do that. And it's 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 it's, it's invigorating for me to see that because it means that we're on the right track. So to answer your question, just maintain relevance, you know, make sure that people who have concerns and have the ability to solve them know who you are and know how to find you. Thank you so much, Dr. Henderson. Our final question is for Dr. Jeffrey Lowe. What is, why is it important for TSU to be engaged in HUD-sponsored policy research? Thank you for that question, Dr. Gardner. In my opinion, it's really important for uh, TSU to be engaged because again, it gives, gives us an opportunity to provide our unique perspective around policy research. It gives us an opportunity to influence uh, policymakers and decision makers in a manner that uh, often doesn't happen. So many of our HBCUs have done excellent jobs. And certainly, um, even as Dr. Lewis mentioned in her presentation, have certainly done um, a par excellent job, if you will, at developing our students and pre preparing them to be um, uh, extremely uh, doers, uh, and contributors to our various professions. And as a result, uh, many of our HBCUs have been known to be good teaching institutions. Uh, however, when it comes to research, we're lesser known. Many of our institutions are lesser known in influencing, uh, and certainly, and when it comes to policy research, we're lesser known uh, for having an influence. And so again, uh, with this funding from HUD, this, uh, it has cracked open the door, if you will, and allowed us to be involved uh, in certainly uh, research that HUD is interested in finding more about. And I will say, uh, I dare say 
uh, given that they funded us, they are really welcoming us and giving us an opportunity uh, to participate in the debate uh, around housing and urban issues in a way that historically has not uh, uh, happened before. And so with this funding, again, um, it allows us to engage in this research and gives us an opportunity to leverage um, funds from other uh, philanthropic as well, or foundation and uh, government um, um, arenas and entities. Thank you so much, Dr. Lowe. Um, for our technology team, I will be uh, moderating the third session for this morning as well. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that. Thanks again to our second um, uh, session, our second um, session presenters. Thank you so much for your presentation and for sharing with us this morning. So we're going to, in, you know, in, in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead. We're about maybe uh, close to 40 minutes behind time. So we do want to ask um, our presenters in our next session to please make certain that we adhere to the time frame that was given. Uh, we'd really appreciate that. And um, we ask that you go ahead and if your mics are off, turn your mic on. Our next presenter is Dr. Vejang Chow, and he uh, will be presenting Innovative Transportation Research Institute. Good morning, Dr. Chow. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for the uh, opportunity for us to present the Innovative Transport Research Institute. And Dr. Li Yu is the director, and I'm the uh, co director. Mm -hmm. And the Innovative Transport Research Institute at TSU was developed in the fall of 2006 by expanding the former Urban tra Traffic and Air Quality Lab, which was first established in year 2000. Actually, I, uh, th this was the year I came here, so we have been here for 23 years. I try receives funds from various federal and state level agencies to support our innovative transport research activities. Our goals are to develop, evaluate, optimize, and recommend comprehensive strategies for traffic congestion mitigation, mobility, uh, mobile source emission reduction, fuel consumption saving, urban transportation planning, and in, uh, intelligent transportation system development through the smart utilization of advanced technologies, large scale computer simulation methodologies, complex modeling system, and state of the art map equipment. So, our missions are to conduct innovative research and development to seek optimal solutions to various transportation problems and to develop and deliver high quality education and training programs to traffic engineers, planners, managers and air quality specialists. So um, our research and outreach efforts are uh, uh, in many place, uh, aspects, including like transportation modeling and assimilation with advanced technologies, and also our traditional uh, transportation planning and management. And also um, this is our uh, special a feature which is to test and model vehicle emissions. We have a state of art uh, vehicle emission testing equipment and uh, modeling capability. And also we in, uh, evaluated the, the impacts of transporting system on air quality and even on the public health. And also we developed uh, intelligent transporting system technologies and applied them to enhance the safety and mobility. And also we conducted the driving simulator uh, studies and the dri related uh, driving behavior studies. And also we utilized artificial intelligence, machine learning, soft computing technologies in transportation. Also we have the components of education training and technology transfer. Our major funding sources are from the US Department of Transportation, National Academy of Sciences, Transportation Research Board, Transportation Research Board National Cooperative 
Highway Research Program, Texas Department of Transportation. Uh, this is one of our major funding sources, actually, Texas uh, TxDOT. And also National Science Foundation. Actually, we are part of the uh, Crest Center that Dr. Lee presented earlier this morning. We are uh, in the sub, uh, uh, second sub-center uh, of the Crest Center also, which was funded by National Science Foundation and also National Institute of Standards and Technologies, and Air Force Research Laboratory, Houston Advanced Research Center, and the University of Transport Research uh, Centers. And recently, we are very proud to, uh, uh, to be awarded the National Center for Sustainable Transportation, uh, which is funded by U.S. Department of Transportation, University Transportation Center Program. There are only five national centers in the country. We are among one of the centers. This center is, is, uh, is unique on the environment, sustainability, and uh, related to technology uh, advancement. This center is uh, led by University of California at Davis. We also have other six consortium member universities and we are the only HBCU uh, in this center. So we will have uh, uh, five, at least five years, maybe six years uh, of continuous funding support from the US Department of Transportation. And we have uh, many state-of-the-art lab facilities the left most is a mobile van. So this can be placed anywhere on the roadside to monitor the traffic. The second one is the driving simulator. And recently we are having the innovations to our driving simulator lab. So we will have more advanced driving simulators, not only the vehicle driving simulator, but also the bicycle simulator, pedestrian simulator, and we can even work together with the driving simulator labs in other universities uh, work together. And also we have the portable emission measurement equipment. This is a very unique uh, uh, our university. Many universities, they don't have this capability. So we have the equipment, we have the technologies. And the right most is the real-time traffic surveillance system. So we have the uh, traffic monitoring images, information data, streaming into our lab simultaneously. So when you see the, uh, you can see the instant traffic operations in Houston area, any of the cameras on the roadside, they can stream uh, the videos into our lab simultaneously. And also we have some uh, uh, sample research to report today. This On this slide, that is a radio frequency identification based driver's smart assistance system. We developed this system to provide a warning message to drivers when the vehicle is coming into an intersection, either synchronized or non-synchronized. Um, sometimes you cannot see the traffic light, sometimes the traffic signs are blocked. So this is a very advanced wireless communication system that can uh, provide warning messages to, to the drivers. We tested this one in work zones, in, uh, and synchronized intersections in uh, synchronized intersection with sun glare, and also we tested them in the driving simulator. Uh, and also, this is another research sponsored by uh, Texas Department of Transportation. Uh, we evaluated the, the vehicle emissions when the vehicles are driving on different roughness of pavement. Well, very few people noticed, uh, noticed this, that when you're driving on different types of, different quality of pavement, the vehicle emissions are different. So we used uh, uh, machine learning uh, algorithms to have tested. We tested the uh, vehicle emissions for 1,000 miles uh, across uh, the entire state of Texas. And then we built up our own models. We got the findings that if you are driving on a very new, very smooth, roadway, the emission is very high. And when you're driving on a very poor uh, pavement, it's, the emission is also very high. Only when you are driving on the moderate level of roughness or pavement, the emissions uh, can get the lowest. Uh, this is our funding to text dot. And also we evaluated the, the transportation impacts on environment and, and on public health on the, uh, on the heart rate, on your stress, and 
uh, noise and uh, vehicle emissions. We tested uh, the design of the on-ramp and off-ramp, this kind of designs and to see their impacts on environment and public health. This is, is very important because currently in the United States, all the design manuals, they never consider about this kind of impact. They just consider about the geometric uh, or uh, physical uh, components. They never consider about the impact to the environment and to the drivers, to uh, the passengers. And also this was uh, another research is also sponsored by Texas Department of Transportation. Uh, we evaluated the transporting equity and uh, we linked that with in-service uh, in performance evaluation of roadside safety devices. So we applied the transporting equity uh, and, uh, and uh, environmental justice theory to uh, smartly distribute the infrastructure for transporting system and uh, so that we will have uh, better safety uh, to protect uh, the, uh, the drivers on, uh, on uh, Texas highways. So we uh, used the machine learning models uh, in the middle to uh, provide our technical supports. So these are several sample research products. Uh, that's all for my presentation today. Thank you so much, Dr. Chow. Um, mm -hmm. Your work is always very exciting. We appreciate so much your thank consistent you. participation in our Research Week program each and every year. And so thank we thank you, you so much. much for your presentation on this morning. Thank you. Next, we have up Dr. Ivy Poon, who will be presenting Advanced Health Equity Program. Good morning, Dr. Poon. Hello, good morning. My name is Ivy Poon, and I am professor in pharmacy practice in the College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. I'm here to present to you a very brief uh, introduction to the Advanced Health Equity Program. Um, the program also, uh, I'm going to abbreviate as the AHIP program that stands for Advanced Health Equity Program. So the AHIP program is funded by the Center of Disease Control, CDC. And the CDC um, a lot of funding that goes uh, to, uh, to the Houston Health Department. And we are a subcontractor with the Houston Health Department. So initially, when the program was first started, it was the intention was to advance health equity in priority tier one and two communities through COVID-related health promotional activities conducted by community health worker. And this is um, because uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we have observed that there is a lot of health disparities and a lot of the areas in uh, around the Houston area where they may have may not have access to vaccinations, and also um, they also you know there are communities that are also have disease day that uh, predispose them to have a higher risk for mortality and morbidity associated with COVID nineteen. So the initial intent was to um, help to reduce health disparities in those area uh, through health promotional activities. As you see it um, on the right side of the screen, uh, this is a map of uh, when we first start off in areas that we want to target at. There are many on the east side of Houston. You know, it goes all the way up from uh, around the Little York area and Cashmere Garden, and then down to the, around Telephone Row, uh, around Fifth Ward, Third Ward. On the west side, uh, we have like Richmond, Rosenberg area as well. So um, these are the target area, the steep cokes that we are trying to target at. The main strategy uh, has been uh, to train community health workers. Uh, TSU as an HBCU is the best training sites for minority uh, community health workers who can actually understand the population. And then the next step is to deploy them. 
So we train CHW, we deploy the CHW and the CHW interns. And at the same time, we also uh, does a lot of community outreach and engagement activities to those communities. Uh, currently, we are uh, we have established a collaborative agreement with the San Jose Clinic, uh, which is located uh, very close to the CTSU campus, about five ten minutes drive. Um, and they are uh, San Jose is a uh, federally qualified healthcare facility, and they are um, they the their mission is to. Um, serve those who may not have insurance um, and also in transition of care uh, for those who doesn't have insurance, basically. So um, also, additionally, we also have a lot of collaborating sites as well. We have been, um, you know, uh, trying to streamline and also uh, uh, also streamline all the resources that we have with CBMHR, RCMI at TSU, the Community Engagement Core. So we have been reaching out in a lot of community events throughout Houston as well. This project is headed by Dr. Veronica Ajawale. She is the PI of this project. I am serving as the co-PI. We also have Ms. Rosalia uh, Guerrero is the CHW trainer. Dr. Assis help with the community outreach events. If you're interested, you can stop by her uh, booths at the community engagement uh, events this afternoon uh, in, on TSU campus. We also have Dr. Okubuye Jo um, helping out with recruiting CHW interns efforts. So what do they do? The CHW, we deploy them to the community and we train them to uh, help with any health equity promotional activities. That could include signing up uh, participants in COVID-19 vaccines, flu vaccines, health disparity topics like cancer screening. So it's not only uh, uh, restrict to COVID, but it also, you know, has expanded to any kind of health disparity topics, cancer, diabetes, hypertension, you know, and a lot of DC states uh, as well. Now, most of our CHU uh, interns are currently are being recruited from the College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. We do have uh, pharmacy students and also health sciences students who are interns with us. We also, at the same time, we have deployed two full-time CHWs uh, into the community sites, and they uh, also are, you know, involved in a variety of health promotional activities. We have been uh, very active in uh, community events, social media, we are on the radio station, uh, we host at least two community engagement events every month. And our work will not be complete without our support from the project manager and also uh, program uh, uh, project manager and program managers. Uh, so Asip, Ziomara, and also our CHW at San Jose Clinic, Geraldo. Uh, additionally, we have several administrative staff to help us with student uh, management and also with uh, administrative work. So, so far, we are about halfway into the program. Uh, so far, we have 14 CHWs interns in training. We have uh, two CHW positions that is available, opened, and hired. Um, we have been uh, doing a couple of radio uh, live broadcasts and also their messages that has been playing in um, the radio station called Radio One. And uh, we have individual encounters as well as group encounters. So uh, we are upcoming in the summer time and also the rest of the year. So this grant is until um, the end of May. So we are planning to train more students and we are planning to do more individual encounters and group encounters. Um, on the right hand side, this is an example of one of the things that we put out for to advertise for our uh, program and events. So 
this concludes my presentation. And uh, I guess we'll save up all the questions during the, the discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Poon, and for all the work that your center does, research, outreach, community efforts, and engagement. We thank you so much for all that you do and for your presentation on this thank morning. You. Next, we have up Dr. Veronica Ajuole. Dr. Ajuole will be presenting TSU Breast Cancer Screening and Prevention Center and TSU Aggressive Prostate Cancer Study. Good morning, Dr. Ajuole. Good morning, Dr. Gardner. Thank Good you very morning. much for um, inviting me to be part of this presentation this morning. And I want to say a big thank you to everyone that has presented ahead. It's so great to hear all the great things, right? The transdisciplinary research that each of us are doing in TSU. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to share and present over the two uh, programs uh, over the next uh, few minutes. Um, my name is Veronica Ajewale. I am a clinical pharmacist by training, and I'm also an associate professor of pharmacy practice here at the College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. And um, over the next few minutes, I will discuss briefly on two of our funded initiatives, one on uh, breast cancer and the other one on prostate cancer. This one is the TSU Breast Cancer Screening and Prevention Center. We are funded by CIPRIT. CIPRIT is the Cancer Prevention and Research Institute of Texas. And here, uh, Dr. Dr. Gardner, can you see my slides okay? I want to make yes, sure. Yes, we can. We can okay. see your full screen. Yes, ma'am. All right. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, here is the uh, team, you know, that makes up, um, you know, all the uh, back, work, back end work that we do in the Breast Cancer uh, Screening and Prevention Center. I have the privilege of being the principal investigator and program director for this grant. And we work in collaboration with Dr. Paul Mirabat, who is a breast oncologist at Houston Methodist Hospital. We also work very closely with you know, our program staff, uh, Ms. Yomara Adon, who is our program manager. We have uh, Ms. Crystal Villegas, who is our patient navigator. She's physically uh, placed at Houston Methodist Hospital Cancer Center. Um, in the Texas Medical Center location. We also work closely with uh, Ms. Monique Bongora, who is the Community Outreach Program Manager at uh, Houston Methodist Hospital. Um, we don't do this work alone. We work closely with several interns and uh, you know students within the College of Pharmacy. We typically have about three students every year. Currently, we have Christine, Andrew, and JD. Those are the interns that we have uh, collaborating on this grant. The purpose of the uh, Breast Cancer Screening and Prevention Center is to provide breast cancer screening and diagnostic services to uninsured and underinsured women. And we provide this service at no cost. So if we encounter women that don't have insurance, we make sure that we have them scheduled for their uh, mammogram uh, services, which we typically provide either uh, in the clinic at any of the Houston Methodist Hospital locations, or we also collaborate with uh, a mobile mammogram service provider uh, through collaboration with the ROS, so that that way we can provide mammogram services to uninsured, underinsured, otherwise underserved population at a location that is convenient uh, you know, for them, either because of time, because of distance, or just you know, uh, um, limiting the barriers you know, related to access to care. Um, in addition to this, we also provide diverse patient navigation and barrier reduction services. And most importantly, we are always out in the community providing breast cancer awareness and education. Some of them we do one-on-one, -on -one, some of them we do on webinars, some of them, you know, we utilize uh, social media, YouTube, Facebook, you know, all other aspects to be able to convey the information that we have out uh, to the community. Our target areas are Aris County, Grimes County, Walker County, Matagorda, and Wharton. So even though we are here in TSU physically located in Aris County, we know that we have the capacity 
capacity to reach all the um, outlying counties, basically because of the high rate of morbidity, mortality, and diagnosis of breast cancer, you know, um, in these uh, surrounding counties um, in the greater Houston community. Now, when you look at the eligibility, you know, how do we determine if a woman is eligible to receive service from our program? Um, we're essentially looking at uninsured, underinsured women, as long as they are uh, greater than the age of 40, if they are average risk. Um, otherwise, if they are high risk, meaning they have genetic abnormalities, they have a strong family history, or if they present upfront with symptoms, you know, that will be concerning for a breast, uh, you know, cancer, or for some form of of, uh, symptomatic presentation, then we are able to provide screening services to them at no cost. Uh, we target specifically medically on the South community in the area, looking at racial, ethnic, and cultural minority, and specifically focusing on African American population. Again, most of our women will be greater than 40 years old following the guidelines, but uh, if we have a woman that is less than 40, if they have high risk for developing uh, breast cancer, we will be able to offer services to them in our program. Um, speaking of the patient navigation, um, barrier reduction services that we provide, we're able to offer assistance with appointment scheduling, transportation. You know, if a woman has an abnormal screening, we just don't leave them. We make sure that we follow them all through to the point of an actual diagnosis. And even when they do get diagnosed, we all know that cancer treatment is very uh it can sink anyone's financial uh, uh, you know, capacity. So we stay with them and ensure that we provide whatever financial assistance or resources that might be available to these women. We assist women in obtaining uh, prior mammogram films and also provide language interpretation for any woman that is non-English speaking. In addition to this, you know, when we look at our uh, breast cancer awareness services, we provide these via outreaches, webinars, we conduct health fairs, we host one-on-one -on -one live group session, as well as, you know, maintaining active engagement on social mass as well as print media. And that's really, you know, the wrap up of what we have regarding the breast cancer program. If anyone is interested in hearing more information, please feel free to reach out to us. We've been, uh, you know, established now a little bit over a year and we have been able to screen more than 500 women at no cost. And of course, out of those 500 women, we've had a few women that have been diagnosed and we've been able to, you know, successfully navigate those women to receive care, you know, at a, uh, you know, whatever healthcare system that is more convenient for them. At this point, I will switch over to talk briefly about uh, the aggressive prostate cancer study. So this study is funded by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. We received this funding um, in 2020, uh, September. That was when we started off uh, with the aggressive prostate cancer study. And this is, you know, in collaboration with, you know, myself being the uh, being the PI on the grant, working in collaboration with Dr. Loud from Colabs, as well as Dr. Oche Mdefo uh, here in the College of Pharmacy. Uh, one of the key reasons why we started out looking at prostate cancer, uh, you know, as a diagnosis is looking at disparities in prostate cancer. Most of us might be aware that African-American males do have a higher incidence of prostate cancer compared to Caucasian males. And you I mean when you do the statistics, you look at you know double, you know more than two point five times greater when it comes to incidence in African American males compared to a Caucasian male. In the same vein, unfortunately, African American men uh, they do have a higher likelihood of presenting with a clinically advanced stage or aggressive prostate cancer at initial diagnosis when you compare them with non-Hispanic Caucasian males as well as Hispanic males. So with this now, we know that early screening, the same way we have, you know, most people are very aware about screening for breast cancer. When we look at prostate cancer screening, we know that early screening for prostate cancer improves the chance of early stage diagnosis and reduces mortality. However, African-American men have been identified to have less or lower likelihood of screening, uh, you know, uh, going in for their routine prostate cancer screening, and by the time they end up being screened, 
uh, when the diagnosis is made known, it's already at an advanced stage or at an aggressive stage. So the aim of this study is then to identify, you know, what are the key elements that are leading to aggressive prostate cancer among African-American women, uh, men rather, and how can we create social determinants of health responsive interventions? Because we know that social determinants of health plays a key role in the overall health outcome of the community. So we have to create a structure or an intervention that is responsive to the social determinants of health of African American males. And then the second aim for the study is to develop social determinants of health based interventions by engaging directly with community members via the community based participatory research model. Um, in doing this study, we didn't do it alone. It took a lot of us to be able to come together to do this in collaboration with Houston Methodist Hospital as well as collaboration with Sankofa Research Institute and the community work group that you know we've worked closely with for over a year. Uh, we work very closely with our community advisory board as well as uh, working very closely with our funding interns. Now, uh, you know, as we are wrapping up with the study itself, there are a few things that are key takeaways from the study, which includes uh, the need for us to establish a prostate cancer screening and prevention center here at TSU. TSU, as one of the largest HBCU, we have that, you know, uh, uh, pivotal uh, uh, opportunity to be able to leverage the trust that we've built with community members, leverage the ability to reach out to community members, to be able to address increase awareness around prostate cancer, we've been able to successfully establish a funding program called We Roar Against Prostate Cancer because we are tigers and tigers do roar. So when we see what we don't like, we roar against it. And that's why we've been able to establish the funding mechanism uh, called We Roar Against Prostate Cancer. We are, you know, continuing to optimize our website so that that way it's uh, community friendly, uh, putting on, you know, frequently asked questions, creates very uh, attractive and user-friendly flyers and educational materials. We continue to stay engaged on mass, social, and print media, and also engage with individual level for advocacy, partnership, as well as stakeholder engagement. One of the resources that we will also leverage, you know, in this journey of prostate cancer um, advocacy and uh, health equity advancement is the upcoming infrastructure that we will leverage in CSU, which is the most units that would house not just a mobile mammography capacity, but also have the opportunity to house a primary care unit uh, room in that mobile unit. And we can easily use that primary care suite when we go out to the community to conduct, you know, prostate cancer screening, to be able to engage with community members regarding education uh, surrounding prostate cancer. And uh, that really brings me to an end of the two main programs that we have ongoing um, on my side of uh, these programs. Uh, we have included here the QR code, the phone number and email address if anyone will be interested in uh, you know, learning more or staying engaged with us. Thank you again, Dr. Gardner, for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Ajewale. Wow, so much work done great work done in such a short period of time, and yet we still have so much more work to do. And so we thank you so much for sharing with us this morning. We're going to move on to our next presentation um, from the Earl Call Institute of Legal and Social Policy Incorporated. We have Dr. Jody Moon and um, the director of, um, Director Guidry. Um, Dr. Moon, good morning. Uh, Director Gidry is going to lead us off. Dr. Gardner, I just want to confirm you can see our screen. We can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm, uh, I'm pleased to be invited here today to talk about the Earl Carl Institute and some highlights from our last year. The Earl Carl Institute was founded in 1992 by Professor Marsha Johnson. It was initially to serve as a research and writing think tank at Thurgood Marshall School of Law but now it has evolved into the mission that's encapsulated here, which is to empower underserved and disenfranchised communities by addressing systemic social issues through legal representation, research, education, and advocacy. 
The vision of the Institute is to serve as one of the nation's preeminent think tanks for research and advocacy on legal and social issues affecting underserved communities, in particular communities of uh, color and African-American communities, as well as low-income communities and other dis disenfranchised populations. We strive to be to serve as a leading voice in promoting social justice and be recognized for the quality of our programs and the engagement of the community. In addition, we strive to live the legacy of Professor Earl Carl. Professor Earl Carl was a founding professor of the law school here. He became blind at the age of 16, and yet he went on to Fisk University. He got his law degree at Yale University and a master's of law at Yale University. He also won several successful lawsuits. He also had his, uh, a, a day named after him in the city of Houston. And so he is a symbol that we can achieve anything. We can change our times. We can change outcomes for our people. And so we try to live that legacy through our work and through our students. And speaking of students, I'm Dr. Moon and I work for Director Guidry and ECI. And one of the really important functions that ECI serves is providing internship opportunities for law students at the Law. Um, I, I have the privilege of working with some of those students along with the director. And so I just wanna highlight one recent um, work that we have going, which is a student who is very interested in the issue around implicit bias and policing. And he specifically has looked at training and the lack thereof honestly, in terms of um, the training that is necessary for police to be doing their job in a, in a much better way. So um, we just wanna share that, that this is one way that we're working with students to encourage them to uh, use their own voice to advocate for change. And you can see we've covered a number of issues over the years. So the way I like to explain the work of the Institute is we provide legal services to individuals. We take those individual stories and the issues and hardships that they face. And then we educate the community about some of these roadblocks and about perhaps research for best practices to try to create grassroots movements that will effectuate changes to areas where African-Americans are over or underrepresented or face disparities. From that, we work on more intensive research to promote policy change and to uh, educate elected officials about how we can make changes that would be positive improvements for our communities. And so on the individual representation, we have four clinics, the Thurgood Marshall School of uh, Law Innocence Project. In that clinic, we represent people who have been wrongfully convicted. We have the ECI Juvenile Justice Project, in that clinic, we represent juveniles who typically have gotten into some sort of incident that's occurred at school, and they have been referred to the juvenile justice system. Um, and then in the Opal Mitchell Lee Property Preservation Project, our goal there is to help individuals maintain housing stability. So that means either to obtain or maintain real property, their homes and their wealth, uh, based on their real property holdings, or to be able to maintain their home against evictions. Um, and when we talk about housing stability, we're talking about the ability to keep your home, uh, but also the ability to keep your child in the same educational setting, the ability to use public transportation if you need to. So, so much is wrapped up in home uh, stability. That's our largest program. And then we have our Clean Slate Cooperative, which also ties into housing stability and economic justice by um, clearing criminal records for those individuals who have records they're subject to um, being either non-disclosed or expunged. Um, in addition to the legal clinics that we offer, uh, ECI has a number of ways that we're engaging in terms of policy and uh, research as well. We have the open access peer review journal called The Bridge. And um, the that at time, depending on the work is an opportunity for some of our interns to publish. We, uh, we receive input or um, articles from others as well. And at times we publish symposia. Um, an interesting one and hearing from Dr. Lowe and Dr. Henderson, it, it really resonated with me. One of the projects 
that we received funding for in the past year was um, working with the Legislative Analysis and Public Policy Association, we call them LAPA. And um, this is funding from the Office of the National Drug Policy, Control Policy Office, the Executive Office of the President. And they uh, contacted Director Guidry to talk to us about crafting some model law language. Um, given our interest in um, supporting our youth, we opted to do a study on the school response to drugs and drug-related incidences in schools. Um, it was a, the, the, the model law language, um, the model law has been crafted, it's about to be released. That was a major purpose of the, of the um, project, but it also facilitated some original data collection. I presented on a conference last week and, and it, it seems that something like this is rather new and interesting and came from a different direction. So it was really exciting. Um, so what we looked at is all 50 states plus the District of Columbia, analyzing state education codes. And to do this, we utilized some of our own interns here from Thurgood Law, but also some interns from the University of Houston. Um, so a, a, a nice collaborative effort. And we kind of took a look at what is in code, what is codified about how schools, districts have to respond to incidents in the schools. Um, so it, it, the idea of research, pure research, that is, all, that is also allowing us to drive change um, is just a really exciting part of what we're able to do here. We also have a number of initiatives in place. Um, the Black Girls Initiative, founded in 2019, has three prongs. And here they're looking at um, first awareness, like making, making it much more clear, calling out the disparities that are very specific to uh, our young Black women specifically. Um, then we have a support prong of this, and we're working with the um, Young Women's Initiative. So we have a cohort of um, young women of color in the Houston area that are looking at ways that they can influence change, specifically um, based on the cohort's, cohort's interest, they're looking at mental health in, um, issues and ways that they can um, help impact change in the Houston area. Really <laughs> exciting work. Um, and then we also, um, this organ this initiative also influences, um, it attempts to influence policy through making recommendations based on the data and research that we collect. We have the Safe and Supportive Schools Coalition. This is a coalition of several groups. Um, we lead the coalition, but some of the names you might recognize, Children's Defense on Texas Civil Rights Project, um, Texas Appleseed. And so here uh, we're looking specifically at the um, disparate impact of discipline and as it's applied to kid, kids in school uh, for the populations that we represent. And um, this, this organization has taken, um, is, is pushing for changes in code of conduct with HISD. Um, they look, they're looking closely at legislation that was passed last year around guidance counselors and their usage, making sure, calling out like whether that's actually being implemented, making recommendations on what should be done differently. So those are some of the advocacy-based um, actions that we've been taking. I'm gonna turn it back over to the director. So as I hope you can see, woven through all of our work, it's addressing issues that negatively impact or disproportionately impact communities of color and specifically African-American communities. So whether it's our research, our policy work, or even our legal clinics, it is all to effectuate change. And so in order to accomplish this, we've learned that collaborations are essential. And so here's a list of the many organizations that we collaborated with. I won't read it through, um, but we've had some really great success in working with these organizations to try to push through change. And then finally, um, here's some highlights from last year. We empowered nearly 2,000 members of our community through legal uh, presentations. We had five trainings on social justice. We had trainings uh, teaching people who have lived experiences and systems, maybe the criminal justice system, foster care system on how they can elevate their own voice and self-advocate. We've done community education, educating attorneys. We saved almost three and a half million dollars in property values and prevented 302 evictions last year. Um, we had 46 interns, 
we talked about the Black Girls Initiative. We were named by the Law School Alumni Board as Department of Excellence, and we received a little over $600,000 in grant funding last year. So uh, thank you, Dr. Gardner, for allowing us the opportunity to share this information. Thank you so much, Director Gidry and Dr. Moon for sharing the information on all of the, the wonderful projects you have going on um, to, that um, positively affects our community. And so we thank you so much for all the work that you do. Our very last presentation for our um, overview, center overview session this morning will be presented by Executive Director Zuri Dale, and she will be presenting Center for Transformative Health, information on the Center for Transformative Health. Good morning, Edie Dale. So um, my name is Zuri Dale. Um, I am a part of the Vision Research and Innovation, and I have oversight over the newly formed Center for Transformative Health. And this center was born out of a need for us to create an ongoing public health agenda beyond COVID-19. And so some of the data that we've collected through our COVID-19 work has presented an opportunity for ongoing health initiatives to prevent and manage disease occurrence while improving livability to transform lives. So the overall mission of the center is to use evidence-based practices that strengthen and enhance the conditions that promote overall health and well-being for diverse populations. Um, the statistics are very clear and they show that black and brown communities and those who live in urban settings were hit the hardest due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And COVID has really been um, a magnifier for some common health problems and has really underscored the need for us to continue to do this work beyond COVID-19. So at the Center for Transformative Health, we strive to conduct research and really develop multi-level interventions that not only drive changes in individual behaviors, but population health. And all of this is to further the science that transform lives. Our goal is to improve health and the quality of life, but we also serve as a research center that focuses on health outcomes of diverse populations for the city of Houston and beyond. This center is a partnership between Texas Southern University and the city of Houston. And so we work with local communities, we work with community uh, collaborative coalitions to develop, test, and evaluate some of the solutions to 21st century health problems. And we also work to develop creative and innovative approaches to improve public health. So our overall initiative is structured around the following five. It's extremely multidisciplinary, but we engage stakeholders and community coalitions in conducting research that focuses on health promotion and disease prevention. We implement many multidisciplinary community-based research initiatives. We design opportunities that address the prevention and control of both infectious and chronic diseases. And so if you look at you know, public health, what many do is they either will choose to focus on infectious or they would choose to focus on chronic diseases. We started out more infectious disease based with the virus that causes COVID-19, but the reality and what we will see with COVID, and I'll speak a little bit on this later, is that most infectious diseases lead to um, post-infection symptoms and post-infection diseases that are chronic in nature. So through the center, we have kind of developed a synergistic approach of focusing on some of those chronic diseases that result from infectious ones. And so expanding access to mental health resources and providers, this is a pillar included. I think we all know that mental health has become a major priority, a presidential initiative at Texas Southern University. So we'll be doing some work there, but continuing to analyze some of the lessons learned during COVID-19, because our goal is that as a university that we are prepared to assist in the next public health emergency. So a lot of our work for the past three years has been, how do we keep the um, COVID-19 agenda um, at the forefront? So when the next pandemic or pandemic-like situation occurs, Texas Southern University is already prepared and ready to mobilize um, our resources. So I wanna provide some of our campus highlights from that. 
To date, we have vaccinated 31,000 plus individuals on the campus of TFU. That number is counting. That vaccination clinic or that clinic is still open. So those numbers continue to grow weekly. Um, as of the spring of 2022, which was a year ago, we achieved unprecedented vaccination coverage rates. And so in the next couple of weeks, we'll begin to compile some of that 2023 data. I'm not sure if Dr. Yen is still on, but we're actually gonna collaborate on that this time around, which I'm really excited about. We distributed $85,000 in monetary incentives to students to really drive our vaccination results. And I'll present some of that data. We've analyzed over 15,000 PCR-based test results in-house, and we've connected patients as needed to care and resources as, as those have been necessary. We recently added a flu assay. So the test is now a PCR-based combination test. That is major for us. It took us a while to get that online, but we are finally online. If you come and test with us, um, we are also able to offer the flu test in, in one swab. So we're doing a lot of research on co-infections as well. Our vaccination clinic has transitioned to a wellness clinic that includes preventative care screening services. So initially at the onset, when we were solely COVID prevention, we only did vaccinations as that is what was um, critical at the time. But as we transition to a pan respiratory situation, and we're not quite endemic, but as we transition, and as the data indicates that in the next couple of years, COVID may be endemic, we have transitioned our wellness clinic to a preventative care clinic. So individuals can visit not only from the campus community, but the greater community to get some preventative care screening services. And I'll be talking later on long COVID. Um, I mean, there are somewhere around 200 symptoms that people continue to report even post COVID infection that have led to some multi um, organ failures and implications. And so it was critical that we not continue to focus only on COVID, but how do we try to help people live and lead healthier lives in a post pandemic situation. We do internal air and water quality testing around campus to continue to monitor the data when clinical data is limited. We also do ge genetic sequencing to monitor variant distribution. We were able to pinpoint down to the day that both Delta and Omicron entered our campus. And that was critical for us because as we design these multi-level interventions, it's important that we know the exact variant that we're working with because those variants have different characterizations. And so we were able to really target interventions appropriately. We also developed our own internal dashboarding system. This was a major feat for us. Um, many people would ask about the data. And while the data was always um, able to be provided, the dashboard was more internal, it was not public facing. But we did do that because my role as our campus epidemiologist was to be aware of the data daily, weekly, bi-weekly, um, and really monitor that for changes. And so at the point that we are at now with COVID, we're able to predict when we will have an outbreak. We're able to look at some of those epi curves and determine what the landscape will look like depending upon the season. We also developed our own campus threat levels, indicators, and action plans. I know that it was a point last year, returning to the university setting um, was something that, you know, there was not a general consensus on. And so what we worked to do through the center is to create our own campus threat levels and indicators outside of the city of Houston, because very often what we saw was that the data at TSU did not, at, on a population level, did not necessarily represent the data in the greater city. So we um, honed in on that. We also have continued our weekly health segment at TSU. And while initially most of it was COVID-based, again, as we transition into a pan-respiratory landscape, that weekly health segment that we have every Thursday morning, um, we continue to talk about some of the newly presented data and how people can live healthier lives. I wanted to present some data though before I stop. This is where we were in the fall of 2021 before 
This is right at the start of COVID prevention. This is right when COVID prevention materialized or conceptualized itself as a center. And this, the, one of the very first things that we did was we wanted to get a lens on the vaccination coverage rate. And so if you look, um, only about 2,000, 2,100 individuals completed that survey, 1,261 students, which was not exactly representative of our student population, but we, looked, we landed at about 73.3% vaccinated. We worked really, really hard in the spring of 2022, which would have been a year ago um, around this time to really up those numbers and to make sure that um, those surveys are more representative of our population. And so we increased our um, response rates dramatically. And you'll see here that we ended with about 4,100 um, responses with the majority of those being students, which is that population that we were very, very concerned about. We wanted to validate that data and see, is this data truly representative of where we are? And so if we look, um, we're at about 76.8% vaccinated, and that would have been last, last spring. Um, but we know things have changed. There is a new um, vaccine that is out now, the bivalent vaccine, and coverage rates globally within the city, within the state, are extremely, extremely low. And so this spring, we're going to be working to get a pulse on that to see exactly where we are so that we can design some of those multi-level interventions most appropriately. But this is our internal dashboarding system. And this is something that many people have not seen. It, you know, I, I never really have presented this data, but this data, and I blocked out some of the names, but we're able to really hone in on who our active cases are um, by date. And so this is for the month of, um, of March. We're also able to um, do some cluster analysis because we're also are very concerned about where are these individuals positioned on campus? What is the case distribution on campus? So we're able to do that. We monitor whether or not they live on campus or off campus. We monitor how long individuals have been experiencing symptoms. This is critical for us because long COVID has recently um, become a part of our um, research agenda, long COVID being anyone experiencing symptoms beyond three weeks. So we do monitor who is still experiencing symptoms after 14 days, 20 days, 21 days. That's critical data for us um, to continue to monitor. These are our um, threat levels, indicators, and action plans. And so this is what we utilize in order to determine, does campus remain open or do we close? Do we do a hybrid? Do we go to remote learning? So we do already have this in our arsenal and our toolkit. So the next time that we have a situation arise, TSU is very well positioned to be able to respond with limited delay. And I'm gonna really just breeze by this and go really quickly because I know we're already over. We've collaborated with Thermo Fisher, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the City of Houston, Department of State Health Services, numerous other collaborators at Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, we've, um, with the National Institutes of Health, we've done a lot of things um, with this work. And we're really, really proud that COVID prevention is transitioning to a structure that is more permanent and a structure that is more inclusive um, of all of the health outcomes beyond the virus that causes COVID. That was really, really fast, but I, I want to stay on time. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing here. Thank you so much, Edie Dale, for all that you do concerning COVID-19, the pandemic here on the campus of Texas Southern University. And thank you so much for sharing the work that you've done and the work that is to come. We really appreciate you. Thank At this you. time, you're welcome. At this time, we're going to go ahead and have a few questions. And so I'm going to ask all panelists to please turn your um, cameras on. And our first question is for Dr. Chow. Dr. Chow. Hey. What will ITRI researchers do with the newly established National Center for Sustainable Transportation? Okay, uh, thank you. With the new National Center for Sustainable Transportation, we will produce research that uh, directly supports the efforts of policymakers and professionals to improve the sustainability of the transporting system. Our research tracks may include like environmentally responsible infrastructure and operations, multimodal travel and sustainable land use, zero emission vehicles and uh, fuel technologies and institutional changes. 
and we appreciate the webinar today for our understanding of other research centers at TSU. I do see uh, possible internal collaborations with our colleagues in computer science, environmental science, uh, environmental justice, urban planning, and health science. Very appreciate uh, to organize this event today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chow. The next question goes to Dr. Poon. Dr. Poon, what is the importance of training culturally competent pharmacists? Um, it's, it's extremely important because pharmacy is a field that need to deal with the patients and provide direct patient care. Mm -hmm. and pharmacists are, um, you know, pharmacies are disrepute in many communities in our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. It is very important for them to, to be able to relate to individuals from different cultures and different backgrounds and try to understand from their point of view and be able to communicate effectively. Um, without that, we cannot function as a pharmacist. <laughs> and yes, ma'am. Just, you know, feel prescription. So that's a key thing to succeed as a pharmacist. So it's extremely important. Yes, very true. Very true. Thank you so much, Dr. Poon. Thank you. Our next question goes to Dr. Moon and Director Guidry. What do you consider your greatest achievement towards systemic change? Uh, well, what we consider our greatest achievement is back in uh, 2013, the, uh, well, we did a lot of work leading up to it, but in 2013, we were able to reduce the number of criminal charges filed against students at school for adolescent behavior um, by putting our clients in the front of the news stories. We were featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, PBS NewsHour came to TSU to film. We had documentary writers from different countries around the world uh, interview us. And so we were pushing to reduce the number of criminal charges that in Texas students faced as a result of what was called school ticketing. And so we collaborated with a number of organizations. We went to the Texas legislature to testify. Um, we brought students who testified who were doing work on the school to prison pipeline research. We had client stories to share. And um, after several years of collaboration, the fruits of our labor were overnight, the number of charges against students went from 270,000 to wow. 60,000. Amazing, amazing. We're proud of that. And then the following legislative session in 2015, we decriminalized truancy, so it didn't create a criminal record for a child. And then hopefully our next big systemic change will be the model law work that we did. Um, the plan is for uh, the LAPA program, the LAPA group to take that to um, the uh, elected officials in Congress and on mm -hmm. a federal level, have it pushed down to the states for adoption. So we're just looking if we can get two or three states to initially adopt it, we'll feel like it's been a huge success. Oh, wow. Well, we thank you so much for your work. I actually have questions for you offline later <laughs> on when we have more time because I have a lot of questions about that. Thank you so much for all that you're doing for our youth. Um, our last question, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Ajawale after she answers her question. Dr. Ajawale. What happens if a woman gets breast cancer diagnoses in your program? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gardner, for that uh, question. And that's a question that we do get often because, mm -hmm. I mean, like we can all imagine, breast cancer diagnosis or any cancer diagnosis period can sink anyone's pockets, right? No matter how privileged or how much money you have in the bank account. So we have the opportunity, even though the million dollar grant from Secret would not fund treatment, the cost of treatment for any patient, we have been very blessed and privileged to have collaborations with sponsors and donors that have contributed and will continue to contribute to support treatment assistance for these women. 
keeping in mind that all these women are uninsured, underinsured, most of them yes. living under poverty level. So every dollar literally counts. So if we're able to help them pay electricity bill, we do that. If we're able to help them pay childcare so they can go for their treatment, we do that. And most importantly, Methodist Hospital, we are also very blessed because that's where I practice as a pharmacist. They've been able to give uh, you know, support to actually take on the very advanced stage diagnosis. So if we have a woman diagnosed with stage four, stage three, very aggressive cancer, they are going to treat that woman at no cost. And I mean, mm -hmm. to say the least, till date, we have already established mm -hmm. care with Methodist Hospital under this mechanism. We've screened over 500 women. We already have women that have been diagnosed mm -hmm. and some of them are already receiving full-fledged treatment at no cost to them. So we are grateful for the opportunity and we continue to look forward to more opportunities to serve the community in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Jawale, for your work as well. Thank you so much. And so again, I, I will go ahead and turn this session over to you. I'd like to thank all of our presenters though for your uh, sharing and for your work and for your participation in our Research and Innovation Week program. Um, again, you know, I tell my students all the time, there's so much great work going on here at Texas Southern University. We really need to take the time as Texas Southern University community and constituents to you know, learn what's going on, get the word out there because, you know, we're a, a well-kept secret. You know, a lot of people hear a lot of things about us, but they don't hear about these good things and great things and the differences that we're making in the community. And so, and in our, across the nation, actually. So we thank you so much for sharing, participating. We really appreciate you, encourage you to come out to the other events. And Dr. Ajewale, I turn it back over to you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dr. Gardner. And I mean to re-emphasize on what Dr. Gardner has said. I really want to say thank you to all the presenters, to all the centers. I mean, it was like a mountain, you know, trying to get everyone together, the schedule. Uh, but I mean, we did it. Thank you, Dr. Gardner. Thank you, E.D. Dale, for working collaboratively with me to be able to do this. And I do appreciate, you know, Dr. Lale and VP Penmasha for their visionary leadership. Like literally them saying, okay, Veronica, let's make this happen. And we are here today with, you know, wrapping up on the first session. I really do appreciate the leadership and Madam President and for everyone uh, that has uh, contributed to the success of this first session. And um, I will just close us out in this first session, make one or two announcements so that we can transition over to the next session that will be continuing on this same Zoom link. So please don't leave. Feel free to hang out, um, out on the Zoom link and also meet us out there on the Swear uh, Auditorium uh, or the Swear Plaza area. Let me just uh, share my screen here. Can everyone see the slides that I'm sharing? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So again, we are excited. We continue to move forward in you know, the program that we have ongoing for the TSU Research Week. And uh, at this time, we will be transitioning you know, briefly into our next session, which is again an inaugural uh, um, event. <laughs> you know, this is the first time. Yay, yes, 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 BD Dale, everyone, all the applause to the team. <laughs> Very exciting. Uh, yes. You know, the first time that we're putting this, uh, you know, incredible uh, event together community engagement, outreach, and research en um, engagement expo. You know, like Dr. Gardner said, we don't want to be the best kept secret anymore okay we're getting the data out of the computer getting it out of the ivory tower getting it to the community okay they are our treasured stakeholders they are our treasured partners and we value and appreciate them so um we are a few minutes behind but we're going to transition into that so feel free to share the word we're going to have health education sessions i already see dr richmond thank you for joining and for being on time we appreciate you we have a lot of sessions on uh, coming up on uh, sexual health 
We have a session on COVID. We have a session on social determinants of health. We have sessions on prostate cancer, breast cancer, mental health. So, you know, we have all these sessions that are upcoming. So please feel free to stay with us on Zoom or better still join us live in person on the Tiger Walk and in the Swear Plaza. We have our LED screen, we have our food truck, we have the DJ, we have a lot of activities. There's free, uh, you know, blood pressure screening, BMI screening, a lot of giveaways, you know, from all the diverse vendors that we have. And this is a screenshot, a snapshot, you know, for those that are pictorial, this is what is happening right now on the Tiger Walk. So don't stay on the office, don't stay in the computer. Come out and join us in person. We have all these vendors and I must say a big thank you to all the 33 vendors. And you know, my team were texting me that we even have vendors that are showing up that are not necessarily on the list. So this is even getting bigger and better, Edie Dale. <laughs> it's getting bigger and better. Uh, so we are really excited and uh, we just look forward to transitioning into the next uh, program. So I will pause here and see uh, Dr. Lale, Edie Dale, were you gonna say something? Sorry. I was gonna, I was going to say, um, I know that we did not announce this at the onset, but the session that we just had was displayed on the screen. So whomever was out did see it. So if you want to wave to the audience, they are actually out there, even though they're not here. I got a text from um, wow. our DJ that they're all watching outside. So that that's amazing for wonderful. us. Um, yes, yeah, that's wonderful. Yes, thank you, Edie Dale, for sharing that. Yes, yeah, so we are live and you know we're already making impact. <laughs> And we look forward to so much more. Dr. Lale, do you have a word or two to wrap us up on this session before we go out? Thank you. Yes, I just want to say a big thank you to all our center directors, but more importantly to this great team, uh, Dr. Gadner, Dr. Ijewale, E.D. Dale, thank you. We had this brilliant idea and you guys were not even at the table at that time, except for Dr. Gadner. And we said, we know you guys can do it. You, we know you can run it and you made it happen. We're so proud of you on behalf of Madam President and VP, Dr. Penn Marshall. We're so proud of what you've made happen today. Thank you for your leadership, Dr. Gadner. Thank you for your leadership, Dr. Ijewale and E.D. Dale. This is amazing, and I can't wait to see what's going to happen on Tiger Walk. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I appreciate the privilege. And thank you to IT team, okay? The Kendry. Yes. Uh, Todd and uh, us, all of them, you know, walking all around. It was a crash course, but we are making it happen. I'm just very uh, grateful. If, if I could give one more thing, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. One more thing is that tomorrow I will make sure I send it out to this group. The fun does not stop here. Tomorrow we have a number of sessions and tomorrow we're also having a staff, faculty and student workshop series. So some of those are going to be virtual. Some of those are going to be in person. So if you could adhere to the schedule that is listed on the Research Week agenda, I will send out a separate graphic to this group for the workshop series. If you will please post this to your Blackboard, incentivize your students in whatever way you deem necessary, ask them to come out to the virtual sessions, at least one of them. We are really trying to build our young researchers from manuscript writing to dissecting a journal article, from some basic statistics and how we can begin to use R, even program evaluation for center directors, center leaders, and PIs. We all have a need to evaluate the effectiveness of our programs. So we have a series that is um, targeted for different levels of researchers and principal investigators. And we want everybody to join in on those sessions. I will send that directly to this group. It will go out via TSU information. It will also be posted on Facebook and Instagram, but I really want you guys to get it out to your students, especially so that they know to attend these sessions tomorrow. Perfect. Thank you very much, E.D. Dale. That's very well said. Again, we want to spread the word out and make sure that we have a great level of engagement. So, center directors and PIs, thank you for joining us. Feel free to stay on Zoom. The only thing that I will do is I will move you from being a panelist to becoming an attendee 
so that we can allow room for all our speakers that are coming in. So feel free to stay on. I will just transition all the center directors and PIs to becoming uh, attendee instead of the panelists. And then um, I would give the baton back to IT to just, you know, hold the space tight for us while we step out uh, to, uh, you know, make the opening remark for the second session. Thank you, uh, Dr. Richmond. I see you're already on. Uh, Mr. Kaderias, thank you, you're already on. And uh, Dr. Gwen, she's going to be moderating the first session. Thank you, I see you're already on. Just give us a few other tips so that we can share with I appreciate you. All right, so again, hello, Tiger Nation. Research Week 2023 has been amazing. I thank you. I see that you are out there supporting our um, inaugural 2023 Community Education Outreach and Re Research Engagement Expo. As I said, I am so excited about our sexual health discussion. You all are going to be blessed with a wealth of expertise today. We have Dr. Taraya Richmond um, speaking to us today about, again, sexual health. Um, she is a native born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. Um, she graduated from Whitney Young Magnet High School and received a full academic scholarship to Mount St. College in Clinton, Iowa. After graduating summa cum laude, Dr. Richmond went on to receive her doctorate in medicine and a master's in public health from the University of Illinois. Dr. Richmond is passionate um, about women's health issues and serving the uninsured and underinsured in Greater Houston. Um, Dr. Richmond opened up her own practice in Houston's Third Ward community in 2017. And she prides herself in providing quality evidence-based medicine. And she's providing that same care right here to students at Texas Southern University in the Student Health Center. So Dr. Richmond, thank you so much. And here's our next speaker. Well, thank you, well, thank all, you so all so much for having, for me. having me. I am excited to be here. I am actually in the uh, Student Health Center right now as we speak. <laughs> I'm just finishing up seeing some uh, students this morning. So I am going to, um, to have the ability to share my screen. Okay. We okay. actually can see you. You can see me? You're on here You're twice. On here. Okay, Th that one's for, uh, the second one is for volume, but can you see, now can you see my slides? Yes, we can see you. Okay, awesome. All right, so. I am again, uh, Dr. And with, uh, regarding the one for volume, it's pretty low. It seems okay. like initially it was a bit higher. Okay, I turned it down because I was hearing an echo. So how about now? Okay, go ahead. We're good. It's better. Yes, okay, we're good. awesome. All right. So can y'all see my screen? I'm sharing my slides. Yes, ma'am. Okay, perfect. All right. So again, I am Dr. Dr. Taria Rich. Rich and, and I'm, I'm no, no it's, it's no doc, doc. And, and I, I like, like it to the kitty gritty. And what does that mean? I love to share, educate, and promote um, women's health, but not only women's health, but sexual and reproductive health. And so we're gonna dive into one of the, um, the subjects that I am very, very um, passionate about, under sexual health, and I'll, I'll share a little bit more about that in a moment. So I know we talked about um, my bio, but I wanted to just to say this again, that I am, I always want to go to HBCU and that didn't work out for financial reasons. I, I was raised by a single mom. However, I am so excited to say that I am a TSU. I am a Tux, Texas Southern University Tiger, <laughs> I am the um, the active uh, university uh, physician here, but I'm also a uh, clinical researcher. So I've, my my background is in family medicine, but I do um, do clinical research, and I wanted to share some of what uh, what we're doing in the community um, in in collaboration uh, with 
uh, next innovative clinical research. So that's the research site that I have also on my private practice, at my private practice. Okay. So um, again, the, the clinic is in the greater third ward area. So I'm here between in between the health center here and the clinic um, in the greater third ward. The most important thing that I wanna share is that uh, we are doing um, clinical trials. And then we are also partnering with um, TSU. Um, for example, with Dr. Dominique, I am uh, one of the physician advisors for the Brothers Project. Um, so we work in collaboratively, not only um, inside the, the clinic, but also with um, TSU and in the community. Okay. All right. So a little bit about me again. I'm, this is my family. Um, we are a family of four, and I like for people to see um, the diversity of a medical doctor because I think sometimes that um, in a, in a uh, research person is that we, we seem like we don't have a, a regular life, but we, we actually do. And that's my husband, Jack, my sons, Jazz, and Jackson. All right, so what I wanted to talk about is um, HIV and HIV prevention and one of the clinical trials that um, we're actively, actively offering right now. So um, 1.2 million people um, in the United States are um, living with HIV. And this is important to know because nearly one in five people, so that means five people who are out of five people who are living with um, HIV, one of those persons is not aware. They, ha they have no idea um, uh, that um, they have a positive diagnosis. And let me say this too, we don't say infected, so I will definitely change that in the future. Um, but the, the uh, one in five don't know um, that they have the diagnosis. And then uh, it's, this is important to me and I'm passionate about um, HIV because 64% uh, of women living in the uh, United States uh, who are living with HIV are um, Black women, although Black women are only 13% of the female population. So that's a big deal, right? Um, again, like I said before, one in, one in five persons, that's everyone, have, um, have no idea that they have the diagnosis of HIV. Now, what's important and why we recommend getting tested is that um, if you have a negative diagnosis and are considered vulnerable to the transmission of HIV, there is uh, medication to help prevent um, the, trans the transmission of HIV in the future. And then also if um, the test comes back positive, while it is, it will be a um, process and uh, it'll, it'll be uh, something that you have to process, there are medications that are available in healthcare that, are, that is available so that you can live a long and healthy life. So what I ask is that, um, that we uh, try not to be afraid of getting tested because on the other end, we do have um, opportunities for prevention and treatment going forward in the future. And so when you don't know or you're not aware that you are living with HIV, then you don't uh, know that it can be transmitted to other people. And um, that is something that we're really working hard to, to really educate on. And those who are at risk um, for uh, being vulnerable to um, HIV are those who um, in, uh, inject uh, inject drugs, um, those who um, may have more than one um, partner or may have one partner and it's not a mutually exclusive relationship. I like to say that uh, maybe you go with the person, but maybe they don't go with you exclusively and may have other partners that you are unaware about, unaware of. And that um, uh, those um, same gender loving men, but like I said before, it's really important to realize that the um, African-American population, specifically women, uh, of all the women in the, it, all the women in the nation, more than 50% uh, of those living with HIV are Black. 
now. And I, and I should go back to the, um, the risk. Um, one of the other vulnerabilities is that if you have ever had a sexually transmitted infection, so that includes gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, herpes, and even the um, human papillomavirus. So the human papillomavirus is a virus that is um, sexually transmissible, but that's the virus that can change the cells of your cervix. And that's why we do um, pap smears. So any of those positive um, diagnosis in the past can make you more vulnerable to um, the transmission of HIV via sexual intercourse. So what I say is go out and um, we were having a conversation last night with um, um, Black moms and talking about their experiences when uh, during pregnancy, their prenatal care and their delivery and postpartum, so after they've had the baby. And one of the things that we left away with um, was that, you know, advocacy is a big deal, right? And so when we talk about advocacy, sometimes we think about advocacy uh, when we go to the um, when we go to the, the uh, Capitol and we advocate to get certain laws passed. But I also like to talk about ag advocacy as a um, patient, as someone who um, wants to know about your sexual health, your reproductive health, you want to know, um, you want to get tested. And so when I, a couple of things I like to suggest, and I'm going to get to the, the point of the research in just a moment, but while I have you all as an audience, I want to say this is for everyone. When, you, um, when you're seeking out health care, and even if you're going to participate in a clinical trial, that you make sure that you have the right doctor or what we call as a principal investigator. And a principal investigator is a doctor who is over a clinical trial, who is over the research. But I would contend that it's really, really important that you know who, who you're seeing, who you're participating in studies with. And then um, when you're in your visits and you're having those discussions, make sure you speak up. Um, because the, the doctor is not the, the end all be all right. We take in the information that you share with us and use the knowledge that we've learned in medical school and residency and put that all together to come up with a plan that works for you and, and vice versa. So if you don't know that if, if you've been tested for HIV, I recommend ask to be tested. And if they ask you, hey, why are you asking for this? You don't seem like you're at risk. I recommend that you say, hey, the CDC recommends that everyone 13, ages 13 to 64 get tested for HIV. I want my HIV test, okay? And then if, and also, also ask, I, and again, I get this all the time, that they did everything. Well, make sure you ask, what are you being tested for if the doctor or the um, those who are doing the actual clinical trial, ask them, what are they doing? What are they checking? So that you're aware um, as much as possible. So remember to be an advocate for yourself. Now, there are um, rapid tests that we can do, and then there's blood tests that we can send into the lab to get, um, to get results further down, maybe two or three days, two or three days later. But the rapid test can be done um, immediately. The results usually come back in about seven or eight minutes. And then if the test is um, uh, positive, then you need a further uh, blood test to confirm. And if it's uh, negative, then you just repeat your testing in three to six months, okay? But I want to say this, that prevention is key. Now, I am a currently, uh, like I said, I am a, um, um, a primary investigator. That means that, again, that I oversee um, studies and clinical trials. And so I'm participating in different, different trials, but I want, really wanted to focus on the Ebony trial. So um, that trial is really looking at um, HIV prevention um, and, uh, well, HIV prevention, some early detection if uh, the screening test uh, comes back positive, but it's really focused on HIV prevention and how uh, we are as a Black doctor, as Black, uh, we're looking at Black females, cis and transgender women um, who are interested in 
obtaining an, an injectable HIV prevention medication, which is called PrEP. And PrEP stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. So in the past, we've had uh, pills, and now we actually have an injection that's every two months. Um, but what, what we're finding is, if you go back to what I said previously um, about the 64% of all women living with HIV are um, African American, but for some reason we have we found that um, the access to something is going on with the access to the injectable prep because that means that you can come in, you can get a shot every two months, and you're essentially protected from the vulnerability of transmission of HIV. Problem, the problem is we're just not seeing the uptake. So we're trying to figure out why, why is that? So I did uh, speak again, uh, speak on prep. I also wanted to say on um, prep, there is a pill. And so there's two, there is one called Discovery and there's one called Truvada. Um, the one that we use typically in women who were born um, with vaginas is Truvada, but just because simply because the other one was not necessarily studied um, in women born with vaginas. So we can't say that we know that it works. And hopefully that research will will come about, but this is why clinical trials are so important. Um, they're important because um, we're mm -hmm. missing out, and when I say we are um, Black people in general, and then um, Black women in this case, we're missing out on the opportunity to have uh, um, access to um, different advances in medications, different advances in certain treatments, um, uh, the opportunity to have, if you don't have health insurance, sometimes if you participate in clinical trials, it actually gives you opportunity to have uh, medical care that you may not necessarily would have been able to receive. So there's lots of benefits of participating in clinical trials that not only help the individual, but also help the community and also helps to advance medicine so that we know that um, you know, every medication, every treatment does not work the same in every one. And so if we don't have us represented, and I mean represented from the perspective of a primary investigator like myself, um, all to the research um, team, and then also um, participants in clinical trials, then we won't have that information. So again, um, I talked about the difference between oral and injectable PrEP. And um, again, in the study, um, the Ebony trial, it is a phase four randomized trial. That means that um, we are at the, the end of the study. We've already found out that the medication is safe, that it works. But again, this study is really looking at how can we get more Black women, cis and transgender women, access to um, it's the injectable prep called Aptitude and uh, across all different settings and in, in private practices. And I'm, I'm happy to say that we have been one of the um, higher enrolling sites. And I'm excited about that because that means that we're getting um, the, the people, the women who need the help, we're getting them the help, we're getting them access to um, the injection. So there's parts that, there's a lot of parts to this, right? Because not only is there the prescribing, is making sure that it's covered by insurance, then it's making sure that providers like myself, doctors like myself know about um, Apertus. So we're looking at the whole big picture of how we can really, um, how can we really help uh, to end the ep epidemic in the community and really get uh, a hold on being able to prescribe the um, prevention medications and the education um, to prevent uh, the, the transmission and vulnerability of HIV. So I'm excited about this study. Um, I like to. I wanted to share this because it does fall under the realm of sexual health, but it's also from a um, from a research perspective. And I know a lot of um, students who are in the the uh, sciences may not even know that uh, clinical trials and participating in cl clinical trials and learning and being a research coordinator or be it a doctor like me. Uh, and being a um, primary investigator is even an option, but it is. And then you can still effectively um, provide 
medical care and then also um, be able to draw information concerning um, whatever topic that you're uh, or area that you're passionate about. And so this just happens to be one of the uh, topics and the areas that I'm passionate about. All right, so I shared basically the overall picture of the study. And again, um, we, we're looking at how from start to finish, how can we get more um, Black women into the office to be able to be prescribed? And when they are prescribed, what are the barriers to being able to access the medication and how can we overcome those barriers? And so that's what this uh, very um, uh, long slide is, is saying. And so again, you all, I thank you so much uh, for having me. I am so, so excited to be here as the uh, Texas Southern University physician. And again, I am a um, primary investigator excuse me, principal, a primary care physician and a principal investigator for uh, clinical trials and uh, research. So uh, with that, does anyone have any questions? And please go follow me on the social media platforms. I'm always sharing health information. I'm always sharing uh, sexual wellness um, and reproductive health um, information. And so are we, are we doing questions? Dr. Richmond? Yes, yes. So question for you. Um, can you discuss what it looks like for someone that is newly diagnosed with HIV, what treatment looks like and so forth? You discussed um, PrEP and thank you so much for talking about both the pill and the injectable, um, the study and the options. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if there is um, a positive diagnosis, uh, we used to wait. We used to wait to start treatment, right? We would start, wait, get all the labs and wait. But now we know through research and evidence that we can actually start treatment immediately. Now, there's more that goes into treatment um, other than just writing a prescription, right? Because this is something, a, a diagnosis for a, a lot of people that is, it can feel devastating and like it's the end. But with the diagnosis, when you're in the right place, there is, we, 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 we love on you. Okay, so that means that we, we're gonna we're gonna support you. We're gonna have um, not only the physician. We'll have a um, a care access person. We will have a, a mental health person to all just come and just really like wrap our arms around you, so that the process is it is. It's, I, I'm not gonna lie and say, oh, it's well, you just get your medicine and everything is good. They're so it's multifactorial and we like to address it. Um, we like to address it not only by just prescribing the medicine, but um, approaching um, with a holistic approach. So you don't feel left alone. You don't feel like you're the only one. Um, and so making those connections, but also from a medical perspective, we can start either the pill and there's also injectable uh, treatment. We can start that immediately. And the sooner you start treatment, um, the better, and that we we know um, there is a um, process called rapid start. We know that if you start start immediately upon diagnosis, that um, your labs look a whole lot better within even 30 to 60 days. And so the, what we used to do before and the medications um, are a lot more, um, the, the safety profile is better and the side effects, not saying that you won't have side effects, but the side effects are not as uh, strenuous on the body as they used to be. Thank you so much, Dr. Richmond. We have come a long way to say that, you know, not only do we have effective treatment, but we truly have prevention now. So thank you, Dr. Richmond. Thank you for everything that you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Mr. Hartman, we are going to cut to Dr. Ajawale. Um, thank you, Dr. Ajawale. All right, so we have our next presenter, Mr. Kendarius, Mr. Kendarius Colbert. Um, Mr. Colbert is a Tiger alum, a 2011 graduate of the Barbara Jordan Mickey Leland School of Public Affairs. Um, he received both a Bachelor of Science in Public Affairs and a Bachelor of Arts in um, Psychology from TSU. 
um, where he served as student, student body president and a, a Ronald McNair Research Scholar. Um, after leaving TSU, he completed a master's, a dual master's in city planning and sociology and social anthropology from Cornell University and Central European University in 24 and 2015. Um, he currently is a director of real estate and land use planning for Providence Health Services. Outside of work, he's a lecturer at University of California, an active member of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity and CrossFitter. So again, Mr. Colbert is going to talk to us about structural racism as a social determinant. Uh, so good morning. Uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Kadarius Colbert. I would first like to say thank you to my Texas Southern University uh, community for an invitation to speak uh, this morning uh, at, or this afternoon rather. Uh, at the Research and Innovation Week. I'm honored and grateful to return to my alma mater even virtually uh, to discuss the subject that I was first introduced to on the campus of Texas University um, and a subject that has served as a lodestar for my personal and professional life uh, since that time of introduction. So as previously stated, I, I do serve as the Director of Planning and Design for Providence Health uh, which is located here on the West Coast. It's the largest, health, uh, largest healthcare system here on the West Coast. And over the past decade, I've served in several capacities, uh, stemming and urban planning focused on health, specifically targeting uh, black and brown populations from education um, and currently in my current role um, of acute care services um, as a director of planning and design for a healthcare system. System, And one of the things that I have focused on since that period of, of working um, and, and serving in several capacities, one of the things that I've learned are the three P's, uh, people, place, and policy. Um, people, place, and policy uh, are, are three P's, are, are a concept that I, I developed uh, during my research to ensure that when making land use decisions, which are very critical decisions, that I always understand the people, uh, certain cultures of communities, the place, the location, um, and the policies when certain policies are passed. Because when certain policies are passed in certain places, um, it has a different uh, impact on the people, a particular impact on people that can have a generational impacts, which are, are both good and are, are bad. So the question uh, that I was asked uh, to kind of focus on today was, is race a factor when considering health de determinants um, in the Black community? And from my research and understanding, even from how we provide clinical services or identify new sites for um, uh, service lines uh, within communities across the seven states that we serve, uh, as a healthcare planner, the, overwhelm the answer is, is yes, overwhelmingly. And one of the, the issues that I'm often asked uh, or in our meetings and planning and discussions, I'm often asked, uh, what are the structural uh, impediments that create or perpetuate health disparities within communities, specifically African-American or Latinx communities? And as a planner, uh, when we are considering the relocation or, or placement of, of new services, we need to ask uh, not only uh, what are the health disparities that exist, but why uh, are they existing in those areas and how do, are they perpetuated? And it starts with a, a root cause. Um, further, I just wanna state that this research is independent of Providence, Providence Health and Services, um, which is a public, publicly sourced data. So this is um, not reflective of the company that I work for. Um, this is independent research. So I just wanted to make that uh, statement as well. But in, in learning uh, about the structural racism and, and social determinants of health, we, we often hear terms, especially in response to the Black Lives Matter movement. There are several conversations that have taken place uh, throughout our community um, in which we, we toss around terms like racism or structural racism um, and, and, and other, other terms. But I wanna ensure for today's conversation that we understand the operational definitions that are commonly used in conversations um, often out of context or without a, a holistic understanding of the terms and impacts. So if you're like me, you ask yourself maybe what is race or what is structural racism or what are social determinants? And so I just wanna ensure that we're all on the same page uh, throughout today's discussion. 
So uh, as, uh, stru structural racism is a system in which public policies, uh, institutional practices and cultural representations and other norms uh, often reinforce or perpetuate racial uh, group inequities. Um, for example, like we have uh, political disempowerment and that might be gerrymandering or uh, realigning partic particular congressional difference uh, districts to ensure that one party or uh, has uh, power voting power of or another uh, party are the, are slicing districts that are particularly of one race or background to prevent um, a particular voting power uh, that could change policies and outcomes in communities. Historically, we have faced uh, segregation um, and from residential and educational seg segregation to financial practices um, at banks um, for, from lending uh, to providing higher rates for black and brown populations, uh, even with equal credit scores uh, to just historic redlining that goes back to where banks prevented uh, blacks and Jews and other minority groups uh, from buying or, or living in certain communities are, are not lending or refusing to lend to those communities at all. And then we have environmental justice or injustice where you have a lack of access to uh, good quality air, soil and our water, uh, which are necessary. And so when, when those things are tainted and often they are tainted in black and brown communities, uh, it creates different injustices that lead to other um, health disparities, uh, such as higher car carcinogens are being emitted from factories uh, that are in proximity to black and brown communities um, in Louisiana and other examples throughout the United States. And then you have criminal justice like uh, punitive uh, examples, punitive uh, punishments, higher sentencing rates uh, for black and brown individuals, um, in addition to other challenges that um, impact uh, the, uh, black, the, the black community um, as it relates to the criminal justice system, even uh, state ordained violence as we have witnessed uh, in response to um, multiple killings of uh, black men throughout this country. And then there are social determinants and social determinants of health can be grouped into like five categories, but they're primarily uh, identified as uh, where you are born, the zip code that you're born in can impact, uh, or where you live currently can impact um, your outcomes from uh, health and, and your quality of life, uh, where you live, where you work, where you play, where you go to church or worship, um, and your age can all factor into various social determinants depending on where you li live and your access to particular um, education, uh, either secondary or post-secondary education, access to good quality health care, um, if it's acute or cl clinical care, as the previous speaker spoke about, um, access to certain treatment plans and things of that nature that disparately impact uh, Black and Brown communities or specific populations. Um, are, is there access to that? Access to a good built environment, cl uh, clean community, uh, good roads, good streets, good bridges, um, also good infrastructure and sound infrastructure uh, that isn't harmful to the population. Um, and then also just the social and community context. Is this a community safe? Um, is it overall a healthy place to live, work, play, walk, run? Is it well lit? And other factors that impact uh, quality of life outcomes. And then the last one, I just want to ensure, ensure that we understand is zoning. Municipal or zoning laws, regulations, uh, that govern how real property can or cannot be used. And uh, Houston is just as a fact, uh, Houston is one of the largest cities in this country without zoning. Um, and it can account for several societal factors that we can see even just adjacent to Texas Southern University at Keeney Homes or down the street or in Acres Homes or other communities uh, throughout the, the city of Houston. Um, and, and, and while I'm on the subject of zoning, zoning is, is particularly administered by uh, different lines or boundaries or borders, um, but I want to state that uh, borders don't exist. Uh, they are imaginary. Uh, they are a part of the social constructs that have real political implications, um, but there are lines and social constructs that have cre been created um, for fundamental gov government structures and uh, administrative practices. However, um, it, it's often that borders, lines, and boundaries are used to create and separate as opposed to uniting in, in more ways than possible. Um, in 2021, the American Medical Association um, made a, a really powerful statement uh, uh, regarding the structural racism and how it affects people of color. Uh, and here is a statement just from the executive vice president. Uh, James Madera that made the statement that um, this is not an opinion or a conjecture that is proven in numerous studies that 
uh, health, uh, that structural racism does impact the health of uh, people of color. And there is a framework for better understanding the social determinants of health and how it plays out into impacting a, a particular individual's health and, and well being. And starting with structural racism, and in this case, as a root cause, and looking at laws and tools that perpetuate that from political processes. Uh, as I talked about earlier, voting dis voter disenfranchisement, um, uh, budgetary decisions, be it uh, not providing equitable uh, fi financial uh, budgets to communities that are needed at an equitable basis, even for uh, the funding of public schools um, or regulation or enforcement. Uh, we could talk about over-policing um, and other uh, political processes. You, we have communities that are uh, predominantly African-American or predominantly Latinx, uh, but uh, due to boundaries, borders, or ger gerrymandering may not be represented by someone who looks and or sounds like them or represents uh, their culture and community. Um, and the systems and how this uh, play out and are perpetuated um, can be from public health to the built environment, education to economic stability. I mean, overall, if you don't have access to good uh, healthcare system or clinical services, uh, that can impact your health and well-being. If you're in a community with poor air, water, or soil quality, that can impact your health and well being. Um, education, if you have um, a lack of uh, quality education at the secondary level or the post secondary level, uh, that can impact your health and well being, your financial outcomes, your ability to be insured. Um, and then just overall economic stability of the community, um, being where you were born and how that may play out in different, different ways. But these all factor, these are systems. Uh, that do contribute um, in response to the tools and root causes that continue to the health and well-being. But remember the root cause of all of this is racism. In most, it may, most cases, due to the history of this country, it has created this, uh, this desperate impact on uh, Black and Brown communities that continues to have generational impacts. And so I wanted to talk about a framework uh, for today um, and looking at the root cause of, of, of this particular community here in South Central uh, LA. So the root cause is racism. The tool that is used is zoning um, and the system that it impacts are at the neighborhood level and the outcomes are the, the health disparities in communities. And so for today, today's conversation, I really just wanted to hone in on one community uh, better known as South Central, which is South Central LA. And it's just about 16 square miles. Now, this area um, does include 42 schools that are in the Los Angeles Unified School District, which are historically have been identified as underperforming schools. It is predominantly uh, Black and or Latinx or Hispanic. And within this community, there are several factors uh, that it could be a comparison to between trying to look at, I guess, to provide a local context, maybe Acres Homes to maybe River Oaks, because I'll, I'll talk about Beverly Hills later. later. But these are two communities with two different P's, two different people, places, and policies. Um, and they have had play, they play a role in the historic outcomes of the health of the two communities. And, and if I go to Beverly Hills, uh, Beverly Hills is further north in LA, but just 30 minutes north of the same community. Um, and it's approximately 12 square miles. I mean, it only has six schools. It has a, sh a smaller population, but you, you see that the major demographic difference uh, is that it is predominantly white um, and African-Americans have less than 1% of a population in this area. In addition to um, uh, Latinx being a lower represent, represented uh, population in this area. So essentially you have two communities within 30 minutes of uh, each other that have two uh, different uh, racial uh, break, uh, breakdowns and uh, also access to different educational outcomes. So one of the, the, the really the interesting reports that was recently released by the CDC talked about higher educational income levels and individuals uh, that have higher education income levels and education levels have lower rates of chronic disease such as obesity in both children and, uh, children and adults. Um, and this is also played, plays out in that in 2016, there was a study that showed that men had the highest 1% of their income distribution, can expect to live almost 15 years longer than their counterparts, um, and one of the lowest 1% of the income distribution. And for, for women, that gap is just over 10 years. And so based off of gender, it can play a role, in, in income can play a role in gender and life expectancy, life expectancy 
But overall, the chronic diseases also play a role and based off of your access to higher income and uh, education levels, which we know that if you uh, grow up in an area with lower uh, socioeconomic um, performance or standards as it relates to um, educational outcomes, that you may have a higher exposure or there, that there may also be challenges within your community if you have poor quality schools, lack of access to healthy food options, food source and um, food, as well as other factors um, that will contribute to your overall health outcomes. And so if you can see there, these are two black communities, predominantly black and Latinx communities that are shown here uh, below and just the uh, income and educational access alone between these two black communities that are adjacent to one another, you see that the life expectancy um, is higher for the uh, more affluent, more educated community uh, with less crime. Um, and that plays out interracially, but when you step outside of the context of looking at it from, you have South LA, uh, which, uh, which shows that black Americans are uh, four, 400 more times to, than white Americans to live in neighborhood communities that lack full service to, to supermarkets. And South LA has been identified as a food desert. And kind of focus specifically on that, I wanted to talk about seven out of every 10 Latinx people are obese. Um, and that is predominantly what makes up the South LA community. And they make up two thirds of the state's food insurance households. And if you look at this area, it is a less educated area uh, with only 8.2% of the residents uh, 25 years or older holding a four year degree. I mean, and just looking at the uh, uh, amount of supermarkets within this community versus fast food re representation, just quickly, uh, just a comparison, uh, you can see that there is a more, more access to fast food options than there are healthy food options from supermarkets in this area. Um, but also kind of taking it a step back and looking at the health index between Beverly Hills and Southeast LA or just South Central LA, these two communities are within the same county, just 12 miles from each other, um, 30, about 30 minutes, uh, have a, a life expectancy and a difference of about nine years. Now, Beverly Hills is predominantly white, has good schools, good health centers and access to other quality, uh, quality amenities, uh, parks and other green spaces. And South Central LA, um, is a food desert. It has it's predominantly Black and Latinx uh, with limited park space, access to good health centers, high performance schools, and it's classified, as I stated, as a food des desert. And you see that there is potentially a nine-year difference uh, in the life expectancy of uh, individuals. And just because of where you're born, where you live, where you work, um, this does play, have, play a factor in your life expectancy and overall outcomes. So is race a factor when considering health disparities in the black community? Overwhelmingly, I would say yes, and also in other marginalized communities. But knowing this information as a planner, um, knowing this information as a planner, I focus on these zoned areas of injustice and the, how the economic stability, educational access to healthier um, quality access and good neighborhoods and other factors uh, play a role in the outcomes of your overall health and quality of life. So when thinking about the solutions, particularly, or things that you can do uh, to uh, improve uh, or decrease the perpetuation of these social determinants uh, being based off of race, um, we can increase access to high performing, uh, high performing institutions at the K-16 level, even providing uh, community college access, increase access to the presence of fresh food and grocery markets, reduce the allowance of liquor stores or uninsured financial institutions that pry um, on black and brown communities with poor residential developments, participate in your local uh, planning commission meetings and city council meetings, improve access to public transportation, bus rail, ride share services, and review your city's comprehensive master plan to learn about future developments in your community. Um, so these are just a few factors and I know I'm short on time here, but um, thank you for uh, listening to today's presentation. I hope that it was insightful and provided some type of insight or information uh, that around uh, on, on this topic of health disparities um, and social determinants. Um, are there any questions? So Mr. Colbert, I have a question for you. Um, working on social determinants of health requires collaboration outside traditional healthcare scopes. 
as a planner, where do you suggest we start? Um, thank um, you. I think that's a great question. One of the first places that you can start um, is understanding what your community factors are. Um, you can start at census and census has a lot of data online that provides information about health disparities, educational quality and in institutions, but also going to your local city council meeting, uh, your state representatives and or your federal representatives to understand uh, what they are doing to improve your quality of life and health in your community. But one of the guiding uh, documents uh, in any community is called a comprehensive plan or a general plan. And these documents are, are, are master plan documents that provide uh, different elements from housing to transportation to lighting um, to access to health. Um, and based off of the zoning of different area or the future zoning of particular communities, um, this plays a role uh, in how, how those documents are, are created. And oftentimes those documents are created without faces that look like mine or yours. Um, but this is, this is important. This is why I'm glad that the Barb Jordan Michelin School of Public Affairs has a public planning program, uh, urban planning program, or public affairs uh, program that I was introduced to because uh, me being able to bring this knowledge back to my community um, is uh, helpful and allows for us to, to lessen those social determinants. But starting with your general plan in your community, starting with your local and elected officials, these are the first places that I would, would start by to better understand what's impacting uh, my area. Thank you so much, Mr. Colbert. Thank you. We have had fantastic session um, wrapping it up. And Dr. Ajawale, back to you. Thank you. All right, what an amazing afternoon. Uh, good afternoon again, everyone. And uh, thank you for everyone that has made time to join us this afternoon in person, as well as online on Zoom. Thanking all our volunteers, the IT team, and everybody that has, you know, stayed engaged with us over the past, you know, several hours. We've been on this program since 8 a.m. And we continue to move uh, further along. Um, as we continue into this program, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. But before I do that, uh, let me just uh, share my screen briefly here and, you know, remind everybody that currently we have our inaugural community education outreach and research engagement. Oh. Give me a second. It looks like they cannot hear me on the screen. Give me just a minute, please. All right, walking through some of the tech uh, things when we are switching in between live, uh, you know, display on LED and also hosting um, participants on Zoom. But, you know, I just want to bring to our attention again that we have our inaugural community engaged community education outreach and research expo that is going on live right now. Yes, Dr. Lale, yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much for all the support, VP Penn Marshall, Madam President, and everyone in, uh, you know, in our entire university supporting us, you know, as we engage in today's program. So please feel free to come out there. We have a lot of free health education screening that is happening, blood glucose, uh, blood pressure, cholesterol, BMI. We have food trucks out there. We have research engagement opportunities, transportation research, criminal justice reform, forensic science, and so many other vendors, you know, that are out there. We have food vendors. We have a lot of giveaway, and there is also music. So bringing everyone in together in, you know, this non-traditional format to promote um, health equity within our community. And so uh, again, I wanna say a big thank you to all our vendors. You know, we are very excited that we have the privilege of over 35 vendors joining us today, you know, providing diverse type of services. Our program this afternoon would not have been successful without the collaboration of all our vendors. So we wanna take a minute to applaud them for joining us and appreciate them and all the centers and programs that invited these vendors. So thank you very much uh, for making time to join us this afternoon. Um, we'll continue to move along here and let me go ahead and uh, introduce uh, our very own E.D. Zuri Dale. Thank you, Dr. Ajawale. Thank you, Dr. Ajawale. Thank you, Dr. Ajawale. Thank you, Dr. Ajawale. Thank you, Dr. Ajawale.
will not need to say. Um, okay, so it is my uh, pleasure and privilege this afternoon to introduce uh, E.D. Uh, Zuridale. Zuridale is an infectious disease epidemiologist and a public health scientist here at Texas Southern University. She's currently uh, working, uh, you know, on a lot of scientific work with special emphasis in epidemiology of infectious diseases. Zuri received a bachelor's degree in biology from the THU College of Science and Technology. She's a two graduate degree from Texas A&M and a biostatistics uh, program for uh, biostatistics of public health specialization from Johns Hopkins University. Is also currently in pursuit of a doctoral degree from Mesa University, so soon to be Dr. Dale. Uh, we are very excited to have you join us this afternoon. She is a member of the American Public Health Association. She's a designated Moderna Global Medical Expert, and she serves on the Moderna Advisory Board for COVID-19 and has held several teaching assignments both here at Texas Southern University and at Princeton University. Zuri serves as the director of the TSU COVID Prevention Center and was most recently appointed as the executive director of the Center for Transformative Health. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to bring off stage E.D. Zuri Dale as we talk about long COVID. So I will turn it over to you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ajawale. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I know we can see this, correct? Yes, we can. All right, great. So my name is Zuri Dale, and I am representing um, the Center for Transformative Health today um, in the COVID Prevention Center. You gave me such a great introduction. Um, I am our campus epidemiologist and I direct the work of our prevention center. Um, I direct the work of the newly formed Center for Transformative Health. I have studied COVID-19 extensively for the past um, three years, ever since COVID was a thing. COVID has been very high on my research agenda. And so as we transition into a, um, pan or post pandemic as as we transition into becoming endemic within the next couple of years it's appropriate now that we shift the conversation from just respiratory health to the way in which infectious diseases often lead to ones that are chronic in nature i do serve on the moderna COVID-19 U.S. Advisory Board, and I'm a designated global medical expert regarding COVID-19. More recently, um, I've been appointed to the editorial board for the CDC Preventing Chronic Disease Journal, which is most appropriate now as we look at the impact that COVID-19 has had um, on long COVID. Before we can begin to talk about long COVID, I want to take a look at the data. As an epidemiologist, my role is to be rooted in the data and to know and understand what the global landscape looks like. And so as of March 5th, um, just earlier this month, there are nearly four and a half million new cases of COVID-19 and 32,000 deaths that are reported just between February 6th and March the 5th. And this is global data. And so that is a slight decrease from the um, previous 28 days, but the numbers are still astounding. The new infections are still extremely astounding. So a conversation um, centered around long COVID and its consequences still remains critically important. As of March 5th, there are 759 million confirmed cases of COVID with 6.8 million deaths being reported globally. So if we take a look at some of this case report data, um, by region, you will kind of see where we look and where we um, stand as a part of the global landscape of both cases and deaths. But I want to talk a little bit about some data that's a bit more local to us in nature. And so this is data represented from the Texas Medical Center. And so because this is Texas Medical Center data, we can make the assumption that the data is a gross underrepresentation. This data would only be reported from those who presented um, to the hospital, who were, presented themselves um, to an institution that's a part of the Texas Medical Center. But as of last week, the seven-day um, COVID-19 testing positivity rate was about 5.9% for hospital systems compared to 6.3% the previous week. So we are down, um, but last week, 
the medical center admitted 100 on average, 100 new, 107 new COVID-19 patients per day. Um, in addition to that clinical data, wastewater data still um, is a part of our surveillance toolkit because when um, access to clinical data is not available or limited, um, we do need to look at the wastewater, we look at the air, that way we can continue to monitor. And last week on average, the wastewater viral load was 272% which is, well, it was 272% above the baseline, which is astoundingly high. And if you look at the discrepancies between the wastewater viral load and the positivity rates, those are there's some gross discrepancies there. And that's what lets us know that there are a lot of infections that are going undetected. There are many infections that are going unaccounted for because individuals have begun to see COVID as a thing of the past. We also can account some of this to rapid testing, rapid antigen testing that's purchased over the counter, testing at independent um, laboratories and independent research facilities, and anyone in general who has not presented themselves to the Texas Medical Center. But the wastewater data does a good job of capturing that as a pooled sample. So those discrepancies alone let us know that there is still a lot of work to be done in this area. But I want to talk a little bit about long COVID and some of the ramifications. And I want to define what long COVID is because we've been talking about long COVID and we've been talking about post-COVID symptoms. And by definition, it, it's an illness that occurs in at least 10% of patients who are infected with the virus that causes COVID-19. And so an individual is um, deemed to be experiencing on COVID if they're experiencing some of these symptoms in excess of three weeks post-infection. And so we are considering long COVID to be a multi-systemic condition, and it often is comprising of severe symptoms that follow infection of COVID-19. As of this point, roughly 200 symptoms, different symptoms have been identified with impact on multiple organ systems. And we'll talk about some of those systems and some of the resulting or some of the, the, the organs that are impacted um, in the next slide. At least 65 million individuals are estimated to have or have had long COVID with cases increasing daily. And as long as COVID is still around, as long as individuals are continuing to contract the virus, we can expect those numbers to continue to increase. So I want you to take a look at the slide. In pink, we have the symptoms as reported by patients when they present. So some of those chest pains, palpitations, cough, fatigue, abdominal pain, um, nausea, cognitive impairment, disordered sleep, memory loss, um, irregular menstruation, erectile dysfunction. These are all some of those self-reported symptoms. These are, some, these are the things that patients who've been infected perceive themselves to have had. But researchers have done further pathological examination, and they've looked at what are some of the um, amplifications of these chest pains and palpitations. And, and what we found is that there's an increase in cardiac impairment post-COVID-19 infection, myocardial inflammation, abnormal gas exchange, impairments with autoimmunity, increases in diabetes, that is a major one, pancreatic injury, that is a major one. Um, deep vein thrombosis, organ in injury, reduced sperm count. And I will not take um, advantage of the fact that I know that you all can see this very clearly, but we can see just in the data alone, there's been an increase in the incidence of some of these um, multi-systemic organ implications following a COVID-19 infection. And so what's interesting is that the impact of these is even further compounded by multiple and reoccurring infections. And I wanna bring that up because there have been some very important miscues. Um, the narrative that COVID-19 only had a respiratory implication has really led to the delay realization that there are neurological, cardiovascular, and other multi-systemic impacts of COVID-19. We have grossly spoke about COVID-19 as a respiratory disease. However, in fact, if we really look at bonding on the cellular level, it's the other organs of the body that have the majority of bonding sites, which, lead, which leads to this 
organ failure that we're seeing in other organs other than the lungs. And so another miscue is that the narrative that COVID-19 cases that are mild or that do not require hospital don't have long-term consequences has been a misstep as well. It had downstream effects on research and they have caused individuals to not be as careful or take the continued precautions that we should. And, and it's really critical that communities of patients with long COVID and associated conditions are meaningfully engaged in long COVID research and clinical trials. We know when we think about minority health and minority populations, our participation in clinical trials is very limited. But this is data that we need to collect in order for us to continue to follow up and see what COVID is going to continue to look like over the course of the next several years. And so as it relates to our community, our reference group and the community that TSU seeks to serve, um, the long-term impacts of um, long COVID are strongly influenced by social determinants. And, and Mr. Colbert spoke about this in his previous presentation, but we see it as it relates to COVID-19. Determinants such as poverty and structural inequality such as racism and discrimination. I mean, economic barriers. Long COVID has had an extremely negative impact on the economy in at least two ways. The first is medical expenses. You know, a single acute COVID-19 case with COVID-19 has a direct median cost of about $3,000 approximately. But if care is sought after infection, so in that period beyond, beyond three weeks, the cost increases to roughly $4,000. And in the case of an individual being hospitalized, the median cost is about $14,000. And if an individual is hospitalized due to some of these symptoms that they experience beyond three weeks, the median cost rises about $19,000. And these are the direct costs of the payer, the out-of-pocket costs. And we know that that presents a barrier because many individuals minority of minority populations do not have medical insurance to cover some of these costs. So there are also some geographical barriers that have resulted um, because of long COVID. There are a disproportionate number of Blacks and minority ethnic groups who have adequate care or access to primary care. And so we recognize that there's a lack of transportation. That's a barrier. Even the use of transportation, public transportation in some areas is limited. And actually, the use of public transportation, which is more common among racial and ethnic minorities, is a known risk factor for COVID-19. There are also occupational barriers. So vulnerable groups continue to be disproportionately represented among essential workers, you know, bus drivers, CNAs, individuals who work in the retail space. They're often overlooked, undervalued, stigmatized, and they face um, higher physical and mental health risks without the financial means to opt out of their work. As a result, we have some of our most marginalized populations coming into greater contact with the virus that causes COVID-19, which is further perpetuating some of these systemic um, ramifications that we know that COVID um, has placed upon us. So we have a lot of recommendations for that. Research is one. We have got to accelerate um, our research agenda. We have got to expand and amplify that. The current research that we have now is simply just not enough to improve outcomes for individuals with long COVID. Right now, there is currently no treatment for long COVID. And we're continuing to try to identify what are some of those symptoms of long COVID. So a lot of data gathering, trying to find individuals who have been impacted, who have been infected, and trying to see what symptoms are they still experiencing beyond three weeks, up to even three years post-infection. And then research. We need a more comprehensive, you know, research agenda. We need to continue training of uh, an education of healthcare and the research workforce. We have to continue to prepare the next generation of healthcare providers. Um, medical schools must improve their education on pandemics, viruses, and infection-initiated illnesses because we can only continue to see these conditions be further um, ex exacerbated. Public communications campaigns, in addition to providing education on long COVID to the biomedical community, we need to do a better job of public communication campaigns, communication campaigns that inform the public about the risks and the outcomes of long 
on COVID. I think that another miscue was that at the beginning of the pandemic, particularly when it came to vaccination, we, we really hit hard trying to get those older and elderly populations vaccinated. And as a result, we misrepresented the impacts of COVID-19 and the impact that it can have on people who were otherwise doing very well. And so now we've transitioned to this post-pandemic landscape and we're seeing increases in these chronic conditions in individuals who did not have chronic conditions before. So in a way we're working backwards and trying to clean up um, a lot of the miscues from before. And finally, we need policies and funding that are going to sustain long COVID research. I know that right now COVID is very relevant. It is, it is the thing. Um, but as time goes by, we need to ensure that COVID does not get lost on the agenda. We need to continue to create institutes that, that service and that research chronic conditions and provide durable funding mechanisms to create more research, more robust research agendas. And I will stop now and I will take questions, if there are any. Wow, thank you very much, Edie Dale. You delved in and you shed a lot of light you know, on long COVID, the impact, and most importantly, you know, some of those symptoms that ends up, you know, showing up and you're like, what's going on? You know, I see patients and they're like, yeah, they had COVID a few months ago and all these things that, you know, coming through and they really right. don't know how to handle it. I guess the question here is how then, because I've seen patients report more like a dismissive behavior from physicians, you know, when they report, you know, some of these impacts uh, you know, from long COVID. So in your experience, how would you, you know, recommend or what would you recommend to patients to continue to encourage them to advocate for themselves to say, okay, this is still an ongoing issue and right. how can they manage it, right? Work-life balance is important. Overall wellness is also important. Right. So there's a fine line in between. Right, right. And I think that we have got to empower people to advocate for themselves. You know, it's difficult. You present, you know, to the, the emergency room or an urgent care and you say, I'm having difficulty breathing. And they do all of the things, the EKG, they do all of the things and they say, well, everything looks perfect. We have got to advocate for ourselves and then say, hey, well, I would like to now get an MRI. I want to know if there's any scarring on my lungs. I want to do a deeper dive into seeing if there's anything beyond what you can see with your traditional testing. So letting people know how they can best advocate for themselves, because when you look at some of these symptoms, they cross many conditions, right? Exactly. I think a very common thing that we experience is that if you go to the, the doctor and if you have a cough or if you say, you know, your throat hurts, if they cannot find anything else, they will diagnose you with bronchitis, you know, but asking and really pushing to say no, I don't want to just accept that I may have bronchitis. I don't want to just accept the general chest pain. I would like you to take a deeper look. I would like to advocate for myself in this way. But it's educating people about how best to advocate and what they can ask for. What treatment can I request? What treatment can I ask for? Where can I go to get a more comprehensive examination? We know that in the emergency system space, when you look at how low income and marginalized communities do not have access to primary care, very often what they do is they go to an emergency room or an urgent care. And uh -huh. it is really only required that the emergency room ensure that you are stable when you leave. They are not required to do this further testing. They are not required to go beyond um, ensuring that you are stable when you leave that space. So we have got to do a better job of asking specifically for the things that we want. And it's our role as public health professionals to educate the public on exactly what to ask for, because otherwise they would not know. They would say, oh, we've done an EKG. They've done a blood test, didn't have a heart attack. I'm done. But how do we know if you don't have any scarring on your lungs? How do exactly. we not? know if there's anything else um, that we may need to take a deeper dive in. I would also say, and we do a lot of work in this area, you and I both do a lot of community health work, preventative screenings are even more critical. Getting your blood pressure, your blood glucose, your A1C levels checked more regularly. So the moment that you see something that is abnormal, you're able to catch it in the earlier stages. The rates of diabetes, the incidence of diabetes has increased astoundingly since 
the influx of COVID-19 infections. Um, diabetes is a major one. We have got to continue to get our communities to get these screenings. Oh. We have got to continue to encourage our communities to get these screenings because we know that primary pre and prevention just costs less than treatment. We've got to continue. We have got to continue to do those things and empower people to be able to do those things for themselves. Absolutely. Wow, Edie Dale, you definitely, you know, you nailed it down, right? We need to be able to empower ourselves so that we're asking the right question. And, you know, and the whole concept of going to the urgent care or going to the emergency room, it eventually creates a tight point, right? On the mm -hmm. pipeline, because you, you know, when you pull those, when you squeeze it too much and everybody has a high influx into the urgent care or into the emergency room, there is so much that can be done, right? So at the end of the day, the same, you know, like you said, myself, yourself, and so many of us here in TSU and all across public health, uh, you know, uh, related work, encouraging and informing our community that primary care is key, right? Prevention mm -hmm. is key. Establishing a medical home is key. Right. Regardless. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. And for, and for us at the university level, you know, we have a more obligation to continue to do what it is that we're doing. You do a lot of work in preventative care through the Center for Transformative Health. We just recently opened the preventative health care clinic where people can actually come on campus weekly, get their blood pressure checked, get their blood sugar checked. They can meet with our staff physician, I mean, with our staff um pharmacist for medication therapy management. We have a responsibility to continue to seek funding to provide these resources to communities that are marginalized that do not have access to primary care. Unfortunately, very often when a person is, is ill, we tell them, well, go see your doctor. But we take for granted that they may not have a doctor to go and see. So we have a responsibility to continue through our own work to value care. And what's interesting is that when you look at infectious diseases and chronic diseases, Infectious diseases are more black and white, right? You have COVID or you don't, you know, you have HIV or you don't, you have tuberculosis or you don't. But when it comes to chronic diseases, we tend to assume that if a person has a chronic disease, it's because they don't care about themselves. We attach value to chronic diseases. We say that if a person has diabetes, it is because they made an intentional so choice. Bad. Or if they bad. Obesity, right. They chose to do this, but we don't really do that for infectious diseases. We just make the assumption, oh, well, well they, it, it was transmissible, so they caught it, right? We don't attach personal and moral value the way that we do to chronic diseases, and we need to change the way we talk about that as well, knowing that if we look at the history of medicine, in this country and the distrust that individuals have with the institution of medicine, we have got to do a better job of empowering them even to reach out to their doctors, knowing that um, we have a greater propensity for asthma, we have a greater propensity for diabetes, we have a greater propensity for obesity, just by nature of the systemic racism in this country. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Edie Dale, you know, for that engaging um, information. We appreciate you. We'll continue to move along into this program. Again, this is part of the inaugural Community Education, Outreach, and Research Engagement Expo. You know, similar to what Edie Dale just said, we have opportunities right now on the Tiger Walk. We have a lot of vendors that are providing lots of community resources. There is free health education and screening, BMI, glucose, uh, blood pressure checks, cholesterol checks, uh, uh, you know, all types of uh, screening that are available right on the spot. So please engage with us. Feel free to come um, out along. We will remain on the Tiger Walk until right about 4, 4.30. We are grateful that the rain has stopped. So uh, we wanna continue to engage with the members of the community as well as our very own Tiger Nation. Um, as we proceed along, I wanna pause again and appreciate all our vendors that has taken time to engage with us um, on the Tiger Walk this afternoon uh, for all the incredible work that is uh, ongoing and that we'll continue to do. Well, uh, we do have the privilege of having KTSU right there um, under the uh, in the Soya Plaza area. So I will turn it over to KTSU as they engage with us in some music while we continue at this programming. Over to you, KTSU. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Thank you for coming back with us for our uh, inaugural research and innovation week. And our Community Education Outreach and Research Engagement Expo. And so for our next speaker, so for our next speaker, we'd like to introduce Dr. Rodney Hunter. Dr. Rodney Hunter is a clinical associate professor at Texas Southern University College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences here in Houston. He's a clinical pharmacy specialist in breast medical oncology at the University of Texas Health Memorial uh, Herman Cancer Center. He served as the program director of the TSU Breast Cancer Screening and Prevention Center funded by Susan G. Coleman. He actively works with the Center for Biomedical Minority Health Research at TSU on various research projects and community outreach initiatives. He is also a clinical assistant professor in the Division of Internal Medicine, Department of Oncology at the University of Texas Health McGovern Medical School in Houston, Texas. Dr. Hunter obtained his Doctor of Pharmacy degree from Texas Southern University, um, a College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences in 2007, and he went on to complete an oncology fellowship at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. So Dr. Hunter is going to talk with us today about breast and prostate cancer. So Dr. Hunter, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate uh, you know, all your attention as we kind of embark on this journey. I know I have 20 minutes, so I make sure I hit the high points and we talk, you know, we talk well and give you guys some great information. Uh, can you guys hear me okay as far as the volume is concerned and clarity? Yes, I can hear you well. Thank you. Uh, okay, great, great. So yeah, today, you know, just education, health education in general, we'll Objectives would really be to talk about some of the functionality of the breast and the prostate gland, uh, talk about some of the prevalence and the pathology, and really truly the reason why patients get breast cancer and, as well as uh, prostate cancer, and then follow that up with uh, some of the various treatment types, probably won't spend as much time on that, uh, then moving into some of the things that can help you lower the risk of either developing prostate cancer or breast cancer. And then we'll, we'll round everything out by talking about some um, clinical resources and some research me uh, mechanisms that you know, you can have resources that you can have to either gather additional information or get genetic screening, all of those types of things. So, you know, looking at, here, let me adjust this. Yeah, so looking, we'll start off with breast cancer, just the anatomy of, of the breast. Um, two major types of breast cancer, of course, um, lobular um, as well as ductal. Um, what people sometimes uh, forget is that men have breasts as well. <laughs> so there's a, there's a small amount of patients that are uh, male breast cancer patients, but it actually does still exist in men. Um, women tend to have more adipose tissue in the breast in, in the breast area, and that is also a place where some hormones originate from, and hormone production originates from, especially in patients who are postmenopausal. So just think about it being not necessarily being a, a cancer that only affects women, while women are uh, a company may or make up about not over 97 percent of breast cancers. So looking as we go further into the, the breast tissue, I was talking about that adipose tissue, that fat tissue. That fat tissue is very important once again because it is it, surrounded and makes up a good portion amount of the breast. But in addition to the adipose tissue, you have lymph nodes that are essentially under the armpits and in various other places um, located around the breast. The lymph nodes are important because cancer spreads through the lymph nodes. So as patients have lymph nodes that are involved, the cancer can possibly go into other areas of the body, kind of like a train station. So whenever you think about the lymph nodes, they're a big part of some people, patients can have breast cancer specifically in a lymph node, um, a specific lymph node that's under the, under the armpit. Now, when you talk about the lobes, um, there's like almost 20 sections of lobes that, uh, that, that we call lobes and that lobular breast cancer is one part. And then you see the milk ducts um, depicted there as well. The milk ducts and the, and the lobes are actually the two places that we're worried most about when we think about breast cancer. But usually it's gonna be talking about either um, lobular breast cancer or ductal breast cancer. Now, this is always a, a big one when you think about the, the prevalence and the types of things associated with breast cancer. Breast cancer is a cancer that's actually driven by hormonal involvement. So as estrogen and progestin are circulating through a patient's body, that accounts for about 80% of breast cancers has some component of hormones that actually cause more the tissue to grow more, the breast cancer tissue to grow more. 
there is still a, another like 20 percent that actually they have um different types of markers that cause it to grow or triple negative uh which of course doesn't have any of the typical markers we check for in breast cancer but you always see us talking a lot about hormones when you think about breast cancer because 80 percent of those cancers are associated with some type of hormone expression and that causes it to grow and grow more now cases in the united states there's actually over almost four million uh, breast cancer survivors that you can identify in the United States. The great thing about breast cancer when you think about screening is that stage one patients, stage zero patients, they have a five-year overall survival that's actually almost at 100%. With that, the reason that's important because that kind of speaks to the fact that if we can catch breast cancer earlier, uh, we, we essentially can cure it and we can save lives. The whole point of, of a lot of the things we're doing here at Texas Southern University in reference to the breast cancer screening prevention programs that we have going, uh, as well as you know now we're, we're diving into trying to identify prostate cancer patients too early on, is that we want to help save lives by early prevention. Um, in the African-American community and minority patients, uh, breast cancer is typically caught at a later stage. And even if you do get treatment, the prognosis is worse. So those, these are the things that we're trying to address here at Texas Southern University. Uh, whether it be through um, access to screening or access to education, or we even get to the point where we want to start helping with treatment. So these are things that uh, Dr. Dr. Loud and Dr. Adjuole have been spearheading uh, most recently to really help impact our community that way. So these are some exact numbers. This is in 2021. The numbers have slightly increased in 2022. Where we see over 281,000 cases of breast cancer. And of those patients, as I talked about, ductal carcinoma, is the most that's that's the highest risk of it turning into a true invasive breast cancer so dcis is like pre-breast cancer and the the ductal carcinoma that's the the origin so it's coming from those milk glands i was talking about um every year um you usually almost get about forty five thousand women that actually pass away of breast cancer and that's the number that we're trying to affect most often we're trying to see where we can address like those women that Maybe they just didn't get screened early enough, or maybe they weren't getting screened at all, and then they pass away um, prematurely. So some symptoms of breast cancer are always a great thing when talking in the community. I always like to talk about these things, uh, the, the, the lump and the, or the mass. So when you look at any of the screening guidelines, they're not going to talk as much about um, breast cancer self-exams, but this is a very important component, um, being aware of your body, being aware of things changing in your body, whether it be the way your skin feels, lumps or masses that you can identify, dimpling, um, discharge of your nipples when you're not um, lactating or haven't been pregnant or not nursing your um, your child. Um, once again, um, swelling of the breast. I think that's something that people don't really identify as much as is that when I talked a little bit about that skin, sometimes it cannot be a lump. It can be a change in the way the skin feels or looks as far as the color on the breast. That's indicative of inflammatory breast cancer, but it's something that's important to be able to identify early on as the patient, not when you get your normal breast cancer screening, because that may be too late or six months after you continue to develop breast cancer. Of the age that you're going to see on an average risk woman can be as high as 50, but you'll see when I talk a little bit more, the, the age of screening can go down as low as 30. So you can actually start, it can be recommended you get screening as low as 30, depending on when exactly uh, you, when exactly like your risk factors, how they show up, your family history, the presence of the BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. Race, also something that, that, we, that we look at. So you, you notice on the slide, it's talking about the fact that Caucasian women are actually at high risk of developing breast cancer. The, the morbidity is where we focus on the morbidity and mortality. So African-American women are more likely to die of breast cancer. And I'll echo this sentiment when I talk about African-American men and prostate cancer. Uh, the menstruation age and the age of menopause are also important. And to simplify this, because uh, I, you know, my pharmacy students, if any of, of them are on or, or <laughs> see it, they know that we talk about this for like 20 to 30 minutes whenever I talk about this in class when I'm talking about breast cancer. But it's just important to understand that because hormones um, drive the growth of the majority of breast cancers, um, the age of the initial menstruation and the age when menopause sits are important. The later you get menopause, the more exposure you've had to um, hormones throughout your life. And the earlier you start your menstrual cycle, the earlier you start being exposed um, to the female sex hormones, which all increase your risk of developing breast cancer. Um, personal history of getting things like biopsies is also something that can increase the risk. 
and um, you know, children, obesity, and children is more about the uh, hormone exposure too. Not having children at a later age causes you to have been exposed to hormones for a longer for a longer period of time because you don't get those breaks during the pregnancy. Um, the exposure to radiation, uh, which is probably more smaller subset of patients, but still there are some sub some patients who maybe had radiation to the chest wall because they had a leukemia or a lymphoma when they were very young. Uh, so that can increase your risk of breast cancer down the line. And then finally, like alcohol consumption. And this is kind of the slide I wanted to get to the screening, uh, the screening test with the mammogram being at the top of the list of what we want to we want to use to identify breast cancer. And then, uh, of course, there's the, uh, the 3D um, mammography is is optimal. Uh, and the large study showed it like the large study that are in progress showed it, you know, there's 2D and there's 3D, but the visualization of the 3D is actually something that they're, they're almost using standard now when you start thinking about screening centers and places that breast cancer screening centers. The breast MRI is something that's done in those high risk patients. So high risk patients get the breast MRI. Most women have an average risk. They're going to get the, uh, the 3D mammography. One thing about the, the uh, MRIs is that they are able to detect um, things that the, uh, the mammography cannot detect. So you'll see the now if you go to the point where there's something abnormal on the mammography, then you could get to the point where you're talking a bit about getting a breast MRI. And I got a few more slides on breast cancer, but uh, for the sake of time, uh, after this slide, I'm going to go ahead and skip the prostate cancer. But uh, this is just talking about women of average risk. And I talked to you about the fact that you can go up to 40, but when you when you start looking at the guidelines, there will be some places where they recommend that you at least uh, start at, at 40 when you're at average risk. And when you're at high risk, and this could be because of a BRCA mutation or because uh, we you did the risk assessment tool and your lifetime risk was extremely high, or you have a first degree residency with a BRCA mutation, uh, this is what it causes us to go as low as getting a, 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 mem a mammography screening starting at age 30. So let me skip to prostate cancer now. So talking about the prostate, um, now we're switching to the men. Um, it's a walnut sized gland that uh, is right below the bladder. So a lot of symptoms associated with prostate cancer are related to urinary frequency, urinary urgency, and things that and painful urination, blood in the urine, all of those are symptoms that you'll see uh, if patients have prostate cancer. It's a slow growing tumor, so it's a lot different than breast cancer. There's sometimes where breast cancers will grow extremely fast to where they can double in size within a month or two. While prostate usually is years and years of development and slow growth because the cancer is typically um, is, is confined to that walnut sized gland. So it doesn't, it only gets to the severe cases where you see it spread out and it, it, they get stage four disease. Most of the time it's confined to the gland. And these are just some of those symptoms I talked about that men should be aware of, um, especially if they're happening at the correct age. Because, of course, like having, there's something called BPH, which I'll touch briefly, that's just an enlarged prostate. Just because your prostate enlarges does not mean that you have prostate cancer. There's a very common, um, there's a common uh, type of syndrome where men frequently get enlarged prostate and they have, high, they have a lot of growth on their prostate, but it's not cancers. So you can also have that. It's called benign prostatic hyperplasia. So the, all of these symptoms are consistent with that as well as prostate cancer. And that's why we have to do additional testing if you have some of these symptoms like frequently having to go to the bathroom at night or having hesitation or interruption of your urine or having urine streams that are going in two different directions or blood in your urine. Uh, sometimes prostate cancer can also affect um, the, the um, erection that men can have. Uh, the age, if you see, is very rare that a patient is below the age of 40 gets prostate cancer. However, it's, there's a one in 30, there's one in 38 men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer being between 40 and 59, and the number gets even higher uh, as you get older. And you see that the majority of the patients with prostate cancer are being diagnosed above age 65. The family history, also something that's important with prostate cancer, you start increasing your risk by four times if you have a, a male first degree relative that has prostate cancer. So, you know, you, you, you go twice if it's like one and if it's two, then it goes up to four times. So that means like father, brother or son, you can identify anybody that's a direct link to you in that fashion you're at least going to double your risk of developing prostate cancer if they've developed prostate cancer. So it, the bottom line is like when you know you have family history of prostate cancer, to be very mindful to start getting your screening when recommended or even a little bit earlier if need be.
um, hereditary things, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation. I talked a little bit about it when we talked about breast cancer, but it also increases your risk of developing prostate cancer. But from a male, male perspective, if you have family history of somebody having a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, the same thing can be said for prostate cancer. You still should start the screening early and start trying to identify uh, risk management tools to help you identify the prostate cancer early if it does, go, it does show up. This slide very similar to that slide that I presented on breast cancer and, and talking about the African-American women having 61%, African-American men having 61% more likely to develop prostate cancer and also the uh, two and a half times more likely to die of prostate cancer compared to their like Caucasian counterparts. Um, Asian-Americans, Hispanic-American, American Indians have found to have less incidence of prostate cancer. So it's just something to identify with that African-American males that affects the minority community uh, more um, in, need, in reference to breast cancer and prostate cancer when you think about death in both cases and even the incidence is higher in African-American men. So that's what we're considering in a high risk group. And you're going to see when I get to pretty much my final slide that I'll present today that we, we need to start the screening early. The PSA um, is just a blood test that can be identified. The digital rectal exam is what most men are trying to run from and do not want to be a part of, but I mean, could identify prostate cancer early or cause it to be treated easier and causes us to be able to, to save or extend the patient's life. So I always have my, my, my claim is that, you know, you think about your family as a man or who, who you want to be here for, who you want to live for, and getting a digital rectal exam is going to keep you here longer to provide for them and be there for them the way they need you to be. Then it's a small price to pay. So, and just going back to just in general, if you're an African-American uh, male, you have strong family history, you should at least start screening at 45. And a uh, patient that have multiple uh, first degree relatives, you actually should start at 40. So these are just like places where we're gonna start the screening earlier if you have identifiable risk factors. Um, and then even after you do the digital regular exam, you do the PSA test, they will need to get a small amount of tissue from the actual prostate gland to actually help um, to confirm the diagnosis of prostate cancer, as opposed to it being like that BPH that we talked about a bit earlier. Now, look at the numbers. The numbers for prostate cancer are much better even than you see with breast cancer. So long as long as we can catch the disease in the local or regional stages, um, the cure rate is very close to 100%. And the patients are typically alive after five years of being diagnosed. So you're talking about a very small percentage of men having to deal with stage four prostate cancer, which is not curable, which is associated with higher risk of death. So the vast majority of men who will be diagnosed, they're going to be diagnosed at an earlier stage. Um, surgery is a, is a possible treatment option for prostate cancer, as well as radiation and hormonal therapies are something that we give to patients. Um, chemotherapy is down the line and typically something that's only done when you're in the stage four cases. And just like, I, I think I'll end here looking at the time. Yeah, I'll, I'll end here looking at the time. But um, when you think about the prostate cancer surgery, which is something that will definitely happen uh, in the earlier stages, um, incontinence, impotence, and, and uh, lack of sperm production is something that are always talked about prior to getting the surgery because there's multiple options in reference to radiation and hormonal therapies that can be used uh, to treat prostate cancer effectively as well. So you have a, a wide range of things that you can do for prostate cancer in reference to surgery, getting medications, or getting radiation. With breast cancer, the same way you have surgery that will definitely be performed. You have radiation that patients will sometimes get and they can get injections or, and infusions. Um, and sometimes like medications by mouth to treat. So very complicated treatment, um, treatment schemes, but ultimately with breast and prostate cancer is how I conclude um, you're, you're looking at very positive results as long as we can catch um, the prostate cancer early. And um, just locally, and um, you know, some places to definitely gather great information from. Of course, um, Houston Methodist is here, has a very robust cancer center. Uh, MD Anderson, I actually practice personally at Memorial Herman. Dr. Edgewale practices at Houston Methodist. So you have TSU representation directly at those two institutions in the clinical in the clinical setting. Um, where you know, I've had multiple patients that, whether it's a student, a faculty member, a staff member, I've had all types of individuals that have actually come to the cancer center and been treated uh, that I've been able to personally interact with and help with their assist with their care. Um, the ultimately what we want to do is we just want anyone who needs treatment to get the treatment as soon as possible because we know we have the best results once those once these cancers are caught early. 
I mean, with that, uh, I'll conclude my presentation. And I, I don't know if I have time for questions, but if I don't, then I thank you guys for all your attention uh, while I was talking. Thank you so much, Dr. Hunter. That was wonderful. Um, I do have a question. Um, so just listening, you know, the 3D mammography option. So I've reached that point in my life. And so I'm there. And that's always presented. Do you want the 3D? And it's offered at an increased cost. And so it makes me wonder sometimes, is it really better? Or is it really useful? Um, that's a conversation I've had in my sister circles over the past couple of years. And so I'd love to get your feedback on that. Yes. So the thing, the thing about the 3D monography versus the 2D is that there are instances, and you may have heard of these instances, where women actually were going and getting their mammogram very frequently, yet didn't necessarily pick up, quote unquote, the lump or the hyperdensity that was present. And then the breast cancer was caught, but maybe it was caught at a more advanced stage. And unfortunately, the way the insurance companies can get around this is because to really make the 3D mammography the gold standard, if you will, of detecting breast cancer, you'd have to compare it directly to the 2D and it had to have a effect on the overall survival of patients that got the 3D versus the 2D. They haven't done those studies, so they can't make that kind of conclusion. So the insurance company is kind of sheltered in that they can refuse to necessarily pay that additional cost for the 3D and make you get the 2D, although the 3D may be the better option for your overall health for you personally. And some patients just can't afford that. So of course they're going to get the 2D and the insurance company doesn't have to pay for the 3D because there's no studies to say the 2D is better than the 3D control studies. But um, clinically, I can say that there have been patients where there was an identifiable um, mass on the 3D mammography that was not visualized on the 2D mammography. And you know that the time is of the essence. Identifying that mass as quickly as possible is going to directly affect how well you do with the treatment and what treatment we give you. Understood. Thank you so much. Um, are there any other questions? Um, I have a not a question, but a comment based on what you just said and based on what hi dr hunter this is miss stewart so hello um, stewart. i can attest to what he's saying because of my family history where my mom dying from breast cancer and me discovering three lumps and having lobectomy uh, surgery myself early on in the 70s um my doctor started requesting that i get the 3d because of the density in my breast. And so the beautiful thing is that picture is so clear. Um, it's, it's just amazing. And yes, I understand that cost factor, but uh, it's I, I can say for myself that it is worth it because I've been doing it for so long now. And, and because I have all of those scans, they're really able to really fine tune and de detect any changes that are going on in my breast. Thank you for that, Ms. That's, Stewart. So it's almost it. like you're building a yeah. timeline. Okay. Exactly. Got it. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. All right. Are there any other comments or questions for Dr. Hunter? And I don't see anything in the chat. Okay. Well, Dr. Hunter, thank you so very much for being here and sharing your, your wisdom with us. I much appreciate it. Thank y'all for inviting me and thank y'all for y'all's attention. I, I appreciate it. So thank you all for staying with us. And again, thank you, Dr. Hunter, for that awesome, awesome presentation. I was just captivated as I uh, have lived that history and I uh, continue to deal with that with family, friends, and loved ones. So for our next speaker, we have Ms. Robin Green, who is a State of Texas certified community health worker with more than 20 years experience as, as a health educator specializing in the field of HIV. She holds a master's degree in health, health education, is a Texas Southern University alumna, and is currently employed as a health promotion specialist for the TSU SHAPE initiative located at Texas Southern University. She has previously worked for a variety of social service agencies to include the NAACP Houston branch, Bread of Life, the city of Houston, 
and Escape Family Resource Center. In her current role with TSI, Robin is responsible for administering sexual health substance use and mental health assessments with youth, college students, and community members. She is trained in evidence-based practices, crisis management, products, campus, and community outreach establishes and community outreach establishes community-based partnerships and facilitates physical and mental health service linkage and navigation. Robin's passion is educating, empowering, and enhancing health awareness among all those she serves. She is a the proud owner of Wanda Azine Wellness Center a nonprofit life enrichment after school programming and fine arts organization serving all greater Houston youth. Robin is also a minister at End Times Harvesting Church, a wife, a mother of four with 10 grandchildren and one great granddaughter. These are her greatest accomplishments. Please join me in welcoming Miss Robin Green. Hello, everyone. I'm so very uh, happy and excited to be here and uh, be representing the Texas Southern University in our research week. Ms. Stewart has read my bio, and I don't have much to add to it, uh, <laughs> except my gratitude for being here today. Today, I uh, represent TSU SHAPE Initiative which is a program that is funded through SAMHSA. And through our SAMHSA grant, we offer uh, free sexual health screenings where we test for HIV, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, um, and hepatitis C. We also are very active in the community where we go out and test we uh, pride ourselves in our work in the third ward and fifth ward area. We, uh, we offer education sessions uh, to people in the community and here on campus. We've had the pleasure of speaking for quite a few of the uh, in, uh, instructors, uh, professors here on staff. We have peer advocates uh, that we work with. We also uh, work with interns and we offer uh, them to receive the hours that they need by working in our uh, program. And we're just very happy to, to be part of this excellent work that Texas Southern is putting. In, on campus and in the community. So let's begin my presentation. Today, my presentation is on mental health. In the meantime, while he's doing that, I'd like to just start talking to you about mental health. First of all, I would like to say that mental health affects everybody. Mm. There seems to be this stigma around mental health that makes us immediately want to disclude ourselves and think and say that this does not apply to us. But mental health applies, thank you. This mental health applies to everyone, everyone. Uh, uh, mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act. And it also determines how we handle stress and relate to others and make choices. So you can see that it affects all of us. Mental health is important at every stage of our life, from early childhood and adolescence all the way through adulthood and even to our seniors. There are many factors that contribute to mental health problems, including our, gen our genes, our brain chemistry, 
our life experiences such as trauma or abuse and a family history of mental health problems. You can go to the next slide. Uh, during this presentation, you, like I said, you may think that it doesn't apply to you. It may, but remember, it may not be affecting you personally, but think about our friends and our family members that may be affected by mental illness. And we can't say that we aren't affected as a, as a society because we see issues, mass shootings, uh, domestic violence, people having issues with substance use, all these things fall under the heading of mental health. So we are all being affected. What, what we're gonna focus on today, rather than just mental health, is mental illness. Mental illnesses are health conditions that involve changes in our emotions, thinking, or behavior. These, these illnesses may be associated with stress and will usually cause us to have problems functioning in society, socially, at work, or in our family activities. I can't stress this part enough. Mental illness is nothing to be ashamed of. Just like we talked about cancer and the other illnesses today, nobody asks to have mental illness. So it's not anything that we need to be ashamed of or we need to work together to reduce the stigma around mental health. It is a medical problem. The uh, disorders that we'll be looking at today are depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, ADHD, and PTSD. Thank you. Here are just some of the numbers that are associated with it. One in five adults experience challenges with mental illness. One in 25 Americans live with a serious mental illness. So that just shows you that this is something that is definitely affecting a lot of people. Next slide. I would like to focus on this slide uh, on where it says students by the number. It says only 7% of parents report their college student as experiencing mental health issues. It's a very low number, but one in three students reported that they have prolonged periods of depression. And 50% of the students received no education on mental health Ill illnesses prior to going to college. One in four students reported having suicidal thoughts or feelings. This is affecting our children. 50% of students related their mental health below average or poor. And one in seven students reported engaging abnormally in reckless behavior. 30% reported problems in schoolwork due to a mental health issue. And this is why this topic is so relevant to us here at TSU and the people that are working in research, in research as well as our students, because we need more research like this so that we can receive the proper funding so that we can give our students the help that these statistics show that they very well need. Next, please. We'll begin by talking about depression. These are the common symptoms of depression, of depression. sadness, irritability, low energy, uncontrolled crying, 
changes and sleep changes in appetite, poor concentration and memory, thoughts about death or suicide. What I'd like to say right now about mental illness is that we may all uh, have some of these symptoms from time to time. It's not uncommon. But what makes it an illness or a disorder is the frequency of these symptoms and the severity of the symptoms. This picture will illustrate what I'm saying. It says, this is what people say. They may say they're canceling my favorite show. I am so depressed. But this other picture shows what depression is really like. A person in the bed during the daytime, you can see the room hasn't been cleaned up. They're still under the cover and they're thinking, why am I alive? This is real depression. Like I said, the severity of the symptoms and the frequency. Thank you. The next uh, disorder we'll look at is anxiety. Constant, uncontrollable worrying, imagining and expecting worst case scenarios and having specific fears like snakes, freeways, thunderstorms. Once again, think about the severity of these symptoms and the frequency. We all get afraid sometimes and may be anxious, but when that becomes a norm for you and you find yourself succumbing to these fears and you can't uh, move in your daily life the way you would normally because of these fears, then that's when you need to seek professional help. And it could be a, uh, an illness. Next, please. Now, we talk about anxiety, but now let's talk about a panic attack. And a panic attack is different from just anxiety. Having a panic attack is a sudden episode of intense fear or anxiety. These are some of the signs. A person should seek immediate help when they are having these signs because these are also the signs of a heart attack. And it can be very difficult for a lay person to distinguish whether or not they're having a panic attack or if it's a heart attack or some other serious illness. So if you're having these symptoms, I suggest, and it's usually when, they, when you're having more than three things happening at the same time, I suggest that you call 911 and seek emergency care. Numbness, dizziness, trembling, sweating, nausea, heart palpitation, and what one of the biggest signs of a panic attack is the hyperventilating. And some people may just say blow into a brown bag, a brown paper bag, but I think that you need to be very careful if you're having these symptoms. Next, Next please. And about anxiety, this is what people say. I hope y'all like our little cartoons. Uh, people say, uh, I'm so socially anxious, I hate small talk. But what anxiety is really like is, I really have to go to the bathroom, but I won't get up because everyone will stare at me. People thinking, these ruminating thoughts going over and over in their minds that they can't control. And they are, these thoughts are dictating the way they live and the decisions that they make. Bipolar disorder. Now we talked about depression and we talked about anxiety and bipolar disorder is like a person that's experiencing both of those things. They have, they, uh, they have what they call manic symptoms, symptoms 
we can, which can be like anxiety with extreme energy or aggression or irritability, racing thoughts, moving fast, uh, not having a need to rest, staying up for days at a time, having these grandiose ideas and goals and risk-taking behaviors and impulsivity. Uh, confusion and, and, uh, and inattention. Now this is on the manic side. And then for no reason or without any control, they swing over to the depressive side and they can't get up and they sleep for days and they're constantly uh, worried about, about what they're doing. This next little cartoon will uh, kind of give a example of, of what the difference of manic, uh, I mean, polar disorder is. Can we go next, please? This is what people say. Oh, you're so moody. It's like you're bipolar. That's what they casually say to people. You must be bipolar because you act one way today and another way the next minute or whatever. I get like that sometimes. But anyway, uh, but what bipolar disorder is really like this. You emptied your bank account to buy expensive boots last week and didn't sleep for three days. And now you go, that was on the manic side. And then, then you go to the depressive thought and it says, yes. And now I've been so severely depressed because I can't stop thinking about how I was mean to a lunch lady eight years ago. These ruminating thoughts over and over again. And they, uh, and once again, it's the severity of this and the frequency of it. Okay, let's talk about schizophrenia. Uh, prime example, we all go down the street at least I, I will say I will. In my travels uh, in third and fifth ward, I go down the street and in other areas of town too. And I see people asking for money, but they're standing there having a conversation, talking to themselves. And this is one sign of someone being schizophrenic. Sch schizophrenia is a serious mental disorder in which people interpret reality abnormally. They begin to have hallucinations and delusions and their thinking becomes extremely dis uh, disordered and that carries on to their behavior. It impairs the way people uh, are able to function and most time requires a lifelong treatment, but there is treatment for it. We, there is hope, there is. But like I said, uh, these people that we see on the street are actually seeing things and hearing things that are making them act the way they act and do the things that they're doing. It's not they just acting crazy or they just doing this. No, this is their reality. And uh, I can't imagine what that would be and how I would feel if I was living like that from day to day. Next is psychosis. Psychosis is also uh, a part of schizophrenia. But you can have psychosis along with other mental disorders that we talked about. It could be a part of them. This is when you have hallucinations, uh, seeing things, hearing things, delusions, thinking people are after you, extreme paranoia, distorted thinking, uh, blunted emotions, not really uh, feeling, uh, sad or happy or things like that. You're just in this state 
of mind where you're disconnected from reality. Poor social skills and bizarre behavior. Uh, next, please. And we'll look uh, uh, at ADHD. Now, a lot of people, when we hear the word ADHD, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, we think about their kids that can't sit down in their chair and can't be still and are constantly moving around and can't focus on their work in school. But this doesn't just happen to young kids. This carries over into adulthood for some people and causes a great problem for them because they cannot slow themselves down and think and focus on things. They become inattentive, they're easily distracted, they miss details, start things and not finish, uh, talk fast, get bored, restless, maybe impulsive and take a lot of risk. Uh, next. Trauma and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, when we talk about trauma, we talk about things that have happened in your life that have had a drastic effect on you. Now, trauma is subjective because what may traumatize you may not be traumatizing to me. It can be based on uh, how we were raised. Uh, I know uh, some people were raised in environments of dysfunctional families and there was so much trauma and chaos going on in the house that it became a norm for them. So it wasn't traumatizing to them at that stage anymore, but it could cause problems from them for them later on in life. So that's why I say trauma is subjective. Some people, we when we think about trauma, we I, I don't know people my age think about men who have been to, in war or who were in the Vietnam War or veterans who may have been around traumatic things. And we think about people who have been in near death ex, uh, experiences. People could be traumatized by having an accident or women could be traumatized by domestic violence or people could, uh, a student can be traumatized from doing their very best in class and then still failing that course. You know, that could be a traumatic in instance for them. So trauma is very much subjective and is, um, it's subjective. I'll just say that from one individual to the next. Uh, different people react differently to the same experiences, like I said. Uh, trauma and PTSD. Some people are traumatized by having the death of a loved one, of a close loved one. That could cause them problem, trauma or even just a severe illness in their lives. Like we, some people may be traumatized by receiving a diagnosis of cancer. So uh, that's why it's, it's good to just say that trauma and PTSD are subjective. Okay, here are some common myths about mental illness. First of all, we think that people with mental illness are all prone to violence, and that's not true. Many times, violence is caused by mental illness, but we can't just stigmatize people with mental illness and say that they are violent people. That's not fair because that's not a true assessment, okay? 
we can't say that uh, everybody that we see on the news doing these crazy things all have mental illness. Sometimes people just make poor choices and decide to do things for whatever reason they see fit. Okay, next. We think that people with mental illness should be able to just snap out of it. We'll say, why are you acting that way? Why are you behaving that way? Just snap out, out of it. Get yourself together. It's nobody in here talking to you. Just go over there and sit down and, and, and be quiet. And we have the notion to uh to ostracize people who may be having the symptoms and dismiss them easily and 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 treat them differently we do because and then is that about them or is that about us so uh the next please some people think that bad parenting causes mental illness or you just behaving that this way because you were raised by this person or that person, or because you're a, a, a child of a single mother, or your mother didn't do what she should have done when you were growing up, and that's why you're this way now. And that's just not true. Next, please. And last but not least, People think that mental illness is caused by a lack of faith. Saying things like, if you would just believe in God, you would be better. Or saying things like, uh, you just need to pray more. Or you need to uh, join church. Or you need to do this. Or also, on the other hand, thinking that mental illness can be cured with prayer and prayer alone. I'm a firm believer in God, but I know that God gives us the wisdom and the knowledge to seek treatment for ourselves uh, and makes that available to us too. Next. Seeking, this is, these are forms of treatment for mental illness. Seeking professional help, exercise, getting adequate sleep, eating healthy, journaling is a great thing if you find yourself having these symptoms and expressing your emotions with somebody that you can trust. I recommend counseling, psychotherapy, along with medication. And I recommend that if you feel that you're having these symptoms that we talked about and they're becoming more frequent and intense and that uh, you can't seem to manage or control your life, please seek professional help. Help is here for you. Don't be ashamed. Don't fall into that gap of not seeking treatment. Uh, next, please. And here are uh, some of the places that are available for help to you. Help is available here on campus, here at TSU Shape Initiative. We're here to help you and to support you. Uh, the end of the University Counseling Center is here and they uh, offer individual, long and short and long short-term group counseling. They help with stress, relationship issues, depression, grief, life and school balance, time management, self-esteem, substance use, anger management, crisis intervention. Next. Here's a little slogan I would like to end, end with. I hope that you gain some knowledge today from this presentation. Knowledge is power. 
And I hope that the situations that you do go through will cause you to grow through what you go through. Uh, thank you. Ms. Green, thank you so, so much for that presentation. Much needed. It's, it's amazing how, how things just come together as they do, because I just had a conversation before 12 today with one of the assistant deans here in the College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, and we were talking about the mental health issues that we are seeing in our students. We have students who are taking leave of absence out of the pharmacy program uh, because, and, and they have documented proof mm -hmm. from the doctor, from the psychologist of, of the, the it's, it's just, it, it's so much going on. And one of the discussions that we were having is that, um, is this something that's just starting? And we both agreed that absolutely not but that since COVID, it has definitely magnified and it probably pulled the layers back to some underlying conditions that were already present yes. in many of our students. And so it's really, uh, I'm glad to know that they have this additional resource through the SHAPE Center that they could come. Um, I know the counseling center is just overwhelmed. Yes, I, I it know is. that I, they are just over because the need is so great. It is. So I so appreciate you bringing this information that I did not know was available, but I will definitely on campus, but I will definitely be sharing with persons here. Um, are there any questions for Ms. Green? I just took the initiative as a moderator. Oh, that's okay. Thank that's you. fine. I appreciate it. I appreciate. I that. really do. I appreciate this. Even the stuff with P PTSD. I look at what my, you know, I have a, a child who's been in the army and I know what he looked like before he left. And I know and what he, he was a like young now. age and what he looks like now. And I just, I said, oh my goodness, all of this is so real. And so many people uh, won't self-identify. They won't tell us what the issues are so that we can give them the resources that they need. And so this is very, very uh, important. You may need to come and talk. I'm going to give your name to our assistant dean of student services and tell him about this presentation because I'm telling him we just had this conversation. And yes. hopefully he will be reaching out to you because we definitely need to include this as part of even when we do a summer academy for our incoming pharmacy students, we just need, this is just something that needs to be talked about all throughout this year. Okay, well, we'll be more than happy to, happy to help facilitate that. And I just want to say, you know, I was given, first given this opportunity uh, about three weeks ago, and I accepted it. And since that time, it's been an outpour yes. of students coming in my office, yes. people sending things about training. I wanna just say to you students, even if you don't wanna ask a question on this webinar and yes. you don't uh, want to disclose your feelings, know that you can feel safe here at the TSU SHAPE Initiative to come in and sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with us and talk about what's going on with you. And we can help you and refer you to the services that you need. So please come by the Public Affairs Building on the third floor, room 302 in. that's where I am. But we have about four offices in this suite and we have case management and uh, services. We service, you do not have to be a student at TSU. That's good to, to know. So I'm gonna ask you if you could repeat that information because I am taking it down and I'm going to yes, share it with all TSU of Yes, we are TSU SHAPE Initiative. We're in the Public Affairs Building, room 302 
NQP. We have about four offices. Okay. In this in this suite. Okay. In the 302 suite. Thank you so much. I'd just like to thank um, all of the panelists that we've had today, starting with the center overview presenters, all of our presenters for the community education engagement and outreach uh, session. I'd like to thank Edie Zuri Dale for all that she has done in putting together this inaugural uh, program, Dr. Veronica Jevole, Dr. Uh, Senior AVP, um, Dr. Uh, Omanike Olalie, uh, VP um, Penn Marshall. Uh, she would, would have been here if she could have been, um, but she is under the weather. So she has asked that we thank everybody and let you all know that uh, she appreciates everyone's participation. This has been absolutely uh, wonderful. I myself am, uh, really am honored and I feel blessed to have been a part of this because yeah. I've learned so much. And then as this last uh, presentation came, I'm, I'm literally sitting here emotional and welling up because it was just something, so something that I needed to hear, mm -hmm. you know, just in the right place in where I was supposed to be. <laughs> With, mm -hmm. with regards to this session. So I'm, I'm really hoping, and I truly believe that many uh, have been helped by this um, expo on today. Um, and so we just wanna make it bigger and better next year, but it has been absolutely uh, great this year. And we thank all of you, Ms. Stewart. Thank you so much, all of our moderators. Thank you, Ms. Uh, and, and I hate to start calling names, but I just want everybody to know that we really appreciate you. This is a great uh, addition to our research and innovation um, yes. week program. And so we just look for it to grow and get even bigger and better on next year. And everybody that presented this year, come on back next year. So <laughs> yes. we just, we appreciate you all. Thank you all so much. Okay. Thank, Thank you all. Y all. Everybody be blessed. You as well. Yes, ma'am.